have successfully kept you connected for 40 years. First as the only earth station that connects Botswana to the world, and then as the only telephone network across the country. We also brought home a mobile connection that has resonated with all as well as a plethora of innovative techno-savvy offers, a digital connection and solution being a large part of that. Because we believe in a transformative culture that elevates and evolves the economy, we are always looking for game-changing technologies that allow for growth across all sectors of trade and that of life itself. For that, we bring forth a platform that will bring together technology experts and consumers to engage, live to explore, and radicalize functional connectivity, as well as impart innovative solutions and to drive a digital transformation in Botswana. Welcome to Digital Shift BW2021. Dumelan. Welcome to the inaugural Digital Ship PW conference, which is coming to you live and virtually from the Travel Lodge in Khaburone. This event, which comes to you under the theme Driving Digital Transformation, is proudly brought to you by the Botswana Telecommunications Corporation. Nike Bidua Juanamuto Ahai, and I'm the CEO of Stansel Technologies, a regional software and technology services firm headquartered right here in Khaburone. As Stansel Technologies, we are excited to be one of the key sponsors and partners in this event, which is a first of its kind in Botswana. For my sins, I will be moderating quite a few of the discussions that will curate and paint the canvas of this event uh, here. Directing the proceedings will be none other than MC extraordinaire, Ms. Giselle Kibakile. Giselle? Thank you so much for your warm welcome, Ohone. Indeed, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be standing with you today for this iconic process for our country, Botswana. Dumelang khape beto, jaka buile kaitedi ake kena oratile jazal kebakile mera wa mukhe la kumpieno mutula kanyong e ha perilenge ya digital shift BW e rekopanyang le baiza na pe ba mola peng le ba mahatse hatse ba zamaranyane le chile tanyo kaza ICT kore ba rekalo sete kore di kabolo tere di putolo la kumpieno tota diamani jang lena lewena. Well, our lineup for this first of its kind experience includes a powerful roll call of both government and corporate leadership. I'm privileged at this moment to acknowledge the, pre the presence of our country's Honorable Minister of Transport and Communications, Re Tulagano Sokoko. I also recognize representation of our host, BTC's management and board, our national regulator, Bokra's chief executive office, as well as a variety of esteemed ICT businesses and organs. So, 40 years ago, BTC began her incredible journey of modernizing communications in Botswana. I mean, do you still remember when your first landline was activated, Mola Bing? And then came the lady who told us to leave a message. And what about the street phones that we used to visit and slot in a 50 tebe to call our loved ones near and far? And then, of course, there was the advent of home and office internet access. And now today, we go even deeper. Ohone, being the astute ICT business transformation leader he is, will captain us through each panel discussion over the next two days. You'll be able to access extensive information on all of our speakers and participating companies via our website. Now, once you've registered, you can even send in your comments and questions, which I'll be most happy to share with our global audience in real time. Well, I believe it's safe and solid to say that Digital Shift BW will be highly interactive, engaging, and most certainly enlightening as we explore and expand on our technological evolution as a country and global player. Ohone? Yeah, I like the lady that came to tell us to leave messages. <laughs> now, very few things typify the evolution of technology in general, much like the growth and maturity of communications technology. We speak now of 5G technology and how it is going to change our lives. And for the record, I truly believe that it will. 
because you see the, the ripple effect the ripple effects and advancements that ride and will ride on the improved connectivity like autonomous machines fintech digital medicine the internet of things smart cities and the like have already started to make the world look a little less familiar and all of this for the better if i may add for those of you who might not be familiar with 5g it is the latest evolution of networking cellular communications technology. I'm hoping I'm not complicating it further. But it wasn't always this way. Just under three decades ago, the first communication technology we had to communicate was fixed lines. Thanks to companies like BTC and present company accepted, we were able to call places and not people. If you called my house and I wasn't there, you leave a message so that I call your house and hope that you get the message. And that's how it worked, really. Mobile technologies came, advancements came, and we had the first generation communications infrastructure, or 1G, as, it was, as, as it's commonly referred to, which technology allowed us to call each other directly by voice. 2G communications technology would later follow. Now, we could start to text each other. If you recall, this was quite revolutionary and phenomenal at the time. Now, Asha in 3G, which placed applications on the palm of our hands. I mean, look at all the applications that you have, you have in your phone that have changed your life. Something as simple as GPS, which meant you'd never have to stop at a fuel station to ask for directions. That's powerful. 4G, on the other hand, brought the video streaming era. Thanks to this advancement in technology, we can seamlessly have engagements such as the one we're having right now, and you watching me, me not seeing you. We now find ourselves at the dawn of the fifth generation communication technology, or 5G as it's typically called. This technology promises to inject exponential growth to tech innovation in general. Throughout this conference, you will hear very clever people use very clever words like speed, latency, spectrum, as we delve deep into this topic and a few others. I'll leave it here and implore you to join the various sessions by our panel of experts that will unpack this topic and many more over the next two days. If you're in the technology space, perhaps some of the discussions that will follow will not completely be new to you, and to that extent, your contributions and engagements will be appreciated. If you're not, however, I hope you find it interesting and thought-provoking. Can you also find time to visit the interactive virtual booths for the event sponsors to learn more about each their service offerings? Indeed, Ohone. Our first speaker this year is the esteemed BTC board chairperson, Ms. Lorato Boakomo Ndakwana. She's recognized as a polished career banker with an impressive portfolio and footprint, including being the third Botswana and first woman to head a commercial bank in Botswana. Bank of Botswana and the South African Reserve Bank enjoyed over 15 years of her service, and she first joined the First Rand Group back in 2004. Well, nowadays, Lorato heads the BTC board and also serves as managing director of Sally Dairy. Here now to open our lineup of distinguished speakers is Lorato Bwakomo Ntakwana. Honorable Minister of Transport and Communications, Rese Gokho, BTC board members online, senior government officials online, BTC Managing Director, Rema Sunga, and your team, Captains of Industry online, BTC shareholders and valued customers, our esteemed media, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. One African philosopher once said, a man who calls his kinsmen to a feast does not do so to save them from starving, as they all have food in their own homes. When we gather together in the moonlight, 
of the village ground. It is not because of the moon, as every man can see it in his compound. We come together because it is virtuous for kinsmen to do so. My fellow kinsmen, today we meet in a completely different world from the one we knew a year ago. We have endured reduced disposable income in households. Businesses are currently facing tremendous commercial pressures resulting in huge job losses. We have braved the heartache of losing loved ones to the scourge that threatens the fabric of our own society. I would therefore like to ask that we take a moment of silence to remember our family members, our countrymen, and all of those who have fallen to the COVID-19 pandemic. May they live in our hearts and memories forever. Your Honor, the Minister of Transport, Resoko, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and the online community that is watching virtually, a very warm welcome to the BTC Enterprise Summit. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of visiting the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona my very first exposure to a conglomeration of the global world of telco. It was an amazing experience for me to see the whole world meeting in Spain to showcase their products, their intellectual capability and ability, their dreams and their vision. Therefore, when the MD of BTC flattered the idea of organizing a summit in Botswana with the theme Digital Shift Enterprise, as part of our 40 years of existence celebrations, I was very excited. I was excited to, because today, united under the Digital Shift Enterprise Summit theme, we stand on the excellence of history. BTC, its strategic partners, domestic and international, is allowing the country to experience in our very own backyard, our very own digital capabilities and creative story showing us a true picture of the competencies housed at BTC, enhanced by solid partnerships and the exciting future opportunities that this telco industry has to offer. Your Honor, over the next two days, through various interactions and platforms, we will be presenters with how digital shift in Botswana impacts our everyday lives and how BTC is the very anchor of Botswana's digital agenda. BTC indeed, Kearona. It is an indigenous homegrown brand owned by Botswana, which when established in 1980, was set up to ensure Botswana live connected. On behalf of the BTC Board of Directors, I'm proud to say that we have not deviated from this mandate in our 40 years of existence, despite all the challenges. We have in fact strengthened this mandate as we strive to balance it with creating optimal value for all stakeholders, including our very broad base of shareholders. Our growth and sustainability as a company is driven by our desire to see every Motswana from the vast geographic land benefit from the use of our services to enable their socio-economic growth. Needless to say, in striving to achieve our mandate, it is a well-known fact that our products and services were tested in an unprecedented way during this era of COVID-19 pandemic. After this test, I can proudly proclaim that at BTC, we, nay, we own a network of the future, which envelopes every Mulzwana in all corners of this vast republic. Our infrastructure has demonstrated that digital inclusion is part to growth and economic viability. It is no wonder, therefore, that we are present in some very hostile terrains in the country which some players deem inhospitable and impractical, as we believe it is our duty and honor to serve Botswana, wherever and whenever they may be in our beloved Republic. When our BTC team members showcase our products and services supported by our partners, as well as our technological reach during the presentations later today and tomorrow, we'll be able to prove that BTC played a key role in enabling remote work at, at a very critical time during the pandemic. And I dare say the shift has happened and things will never be the same again. It is our view that access to ICT and data is an economic activity and a right for all communities. 
as a means to communicate, to doing business and to grow our country now and in the future. I'm proud to say that in the last few years, BTC has touched all economic sectors in all parts of the country, enabled by its wide network coverage and fast internet speeds. This digital shift has been ongoing over the last few years since the days of the launch of the Intelesa project in 1999, which brought services to previously underserved remote communities, to the launch of our mobile businesses in 2008, to being Botswana's leading network with over 404.5G sites enveloping all corners of the country, not just major towns and cities currently. Our visa technology has enabled remote customers far from the national grid to live connected. Throughout the engagements on the digital shifts happening locally and globally during the summit, we're going to hear interesting presentations, conversations and debates on thought-provoking topics such as government's digital agenda for the country and how, as we, be, how as we as BTC have positioned ourselves to take advantage of and be a key player in this agenda and anticipate the needs of our citizens. We hope our regulator will give us a sense of what they are doing to create an enabling environment for players such as ourselves, as well as ensuring that users have the much needed adequate protections. We look forward to the digital shift case studies. I'm especially looking forward to listening to the Korea Telecom Transformation Strategy and Future Positioning, which will give us a glimpse of how they become a force to be reckoned with in the telco space globally. There are many esteemed partners who will share a lot with us over the next two days. We look forward to your presentations and we value your time. I'm proud to mention that BTC customers have access to computer storage and software-defined network resources on demand through the company's cloud management platform. This has been enhanced by our recent partnership with Microsoft for cloud services. I'm happy to acknowledge BTC's dynamic infrastructure, which was not so long ago put to test when we successfully held and I shared our very first virtual AGM in October 2020. As a former banker, I'm fascinated by the fintech innovations. That healthy tension that always exists with the, between the traditional banks and the technology banks only brings interesting products and services by both banks and the mobile companies, which will, uh, which will be most beneficial to the end user. I'll be listening attentively to the increasing role of mobile money and outreach to the, outreach to the non-banked people in our country. Of course, the big debate being the anxieties about security, about my tough end, pullers and tabers, as well as money laundering issues. I'm currently a manufacturer, and I'll be following very closely the conversations on the Internet of Things and how technology can boost the manufacturing sector in Botswana. The Internet of Things is the future, and there are fascinating developments in this area. I believe this to be a good opportunity area for the BTC in the future. The Digital Shift Botswana, powered by BTC Driving Digital Transformation theme, rings true in the wealth of expertise surrounding the summit as we forge new ideas, new networks, strong partnerships and relationships in making sure that no one is left behind in our quest for driving the digital agenda. Dozens of experts are here today, vital strategic partners to the BTC family. What we are to experience here is a result of a united front of telco genius and innovation coming together from different partners at home and abroad. We thank you all for your efforts and the success of making this dream a reality that we will enjoy over the next two days. We are grateful for your presence and role in assisting us grow BTC to be one of the shining stars of our generations and our time. Most of ceremonies with those few remarks, I would like to wish all the participants an enjoyable summit. Thank you.
Dumelan Kape. You see, the role of government in uh, shaping digital transformation is not only in fostering policy that is encouraging to innovation, but it's also in consuming the outputs and the products of that innovation. Please welcome, please will join me in welcoming to the stage the Honorable Minister of Transport and Communication, Red Tulahano Sehoch. Honourable Members of Parliament here present, Permanent Secretary to the President, all Permanent Secretaries, all Heads of Departments, all Heads of Parastatals and Private Sector here present, BTCL Board Chair, Member, Members of the BTCL Board and Senior Management, Captains of Industry, the Media Fraternity, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good morning and all protocol observed. Uh, Director of Ceremonies, I have the honor and privilege to be here with you today to officiate at this important occasion for the Technology and Business Summit. This occasion creates a platform for the information and communication technology sector to showcase innovative technology solutions for the business, community, government, and the general public. Distinguished delegates, BTC was established in 1980 through an act of parliament. Throughout the years, government has been recognizing the critical role that BTC has been playing in different sectors of the economy. In this regard, government, in collaboration with all relevant stakeholders, has been steadfast in formulating policies that create an enabling environment for doing business. Director of Ceremonies, you'll concur with me that BTCL has gone through tremendous transformation from its inception. In 1985, the then Ministry of Works, Transport and Communications developed the telecommunications policy to achieve universal access of services promote the sector growth, and to liberalize the market. Through the policy, there was a change in the institutional arrangement where government focused on the policy formulation. Botswana Telecommunications Authority was established as a regulator uh, while the private sector entered the market to provide telecommunications services. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be interested to know that in the quest to achieve an inclusive digital agenda. In 2006, the then Ministry of, of Communication, Science and Technology introduced further liberalization in the market. Other interventions that took Botswana ICT to where it is are uh, the National ICT Policy, or Maitlamo, BTC Privatization, the BOCRA Act, Universal Access, uh, Universal Service and Access Fund, National Broadband Strategy, and the Smart Botswana Strategy, just to mention a few. Botswana is constantly building the broadband ecosystem, which integrates government services, content, applications, business community, and the society. All those interventions contributed 
to creating Botswana's next value frontier. Director of Ceremonies, Government Regulatory Reforms has turned the country into one of the most liberalized telecommunications market in the, in, in the region, including a new service neutral licensing regime, which takes into account the increasing convergence of technologies and services. In 2016, BTC became the first telecommunication service provider to be listed on the Botswana Stock Exchange. The same year, they became a one-stop communication business through the integration of B-Mobile and BTC into a monolithic brand. They have been blazing trails ever since. This summit presents us a, an opportunity to share alignment with the broader national strategies when it comes to telecommunications, ICT, and digitization. Ladies and gentlemen, in order for Botswana to achieve prosperity for all, we need to embrace the digital era and strategize and implement initiatives that will drive us forward as a nation. According to the World Data Atlas, Botswana's youth literacy rate is at 97.81% as of 2015, one of the highest in Africa. This is a huge advantage. We have to leverage it by availing le learning opportunities and educative platforms to young people so that we can build a knowledgeable and mentally capable nation of youth that are strong in character and rich in content. Distinguished delegates, Following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the surge in the uptake and consumption of internet services, nationally, regionally, and internationally. Countries are increasingly beginning to integrate digital solutions into the various areas of their economies and also developing the human capital towards the digital economy. Distinguished delegates, as you might be aware, we cannot work in isolation to achieve our goals and ideals. We have to collaborate with other countries in light, in light of that, Director of Ceremonies, the 2019 Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement was signed by 50 member states and Botswana is one of these countries. The aim of the agreement is to make Africa a self-contained market to double trade flows, boost intra-Africa trade, and remove 90% tariffs on goods. This agreement has allowed for cross-border data transfer, which has become intrinsic to the essence of today's modern business. The framework ensures the protection of privacy, fundamental rights, and freedoms of data subjects. Director of Ceremonies, with new technological developments, there are new threats to consider as a nation. The transfers, the transference of data across borders means the risk of cyber attacks and data breaches. World Investment Report 2017 cited that cyber threats and data security Will influence, future global, will influence future global investments. There is an expediency for the establishment of data protection authorities to counter these rising and pronounced threats. Left unattended, they have the potential to dent the reputation of companies and to put personal security at risk solid and all-encompassing data protection laws ought to be developed. Distinguished delegates, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. We cannot afford to miss it as a nation. The revolution is built on internet access, new transformative applications to communicate and produce content that can be processed and used for many services. In order for the nation to be part of and benefit from this revolution, all stakeholders must play their role and drive broadband deployment 
and uptake through the promotion and utilization of broadband technologies in government services, education, agriculture, cybersecurity, healthcare, teleworking and investment in new and diverse communication technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, as we push to the fourth industrial revolution, it's imperative to have a national vision. Vision 2036 is instrumental in building a sustainable economy to facilitate human and social development. Effective collaboration between governments, civil society, and the private sector will be most critical in developing goals that are inclusive. Participation, transparency, and multi-stakeholders function as the cornerstones of inclusivity, as mentioned by in the United Nations Agenda 2030. Distinguished delegates, technological developments are meant for the improvement of livelihoods. Without uptake, they do not impact our lives. BTL, BTCL is offering many products and services that are worth considering. The 50 megabits per second delivered by BTC's VSET technologies on hostile terrains is a case in point. And I thank you very much, Nelwang Kipula. BTC is Botswana's fastest and most widely available 4G network. Our network covers more towns and villages across the country so you can connect to the things and people you care about the most. Whether you're in Khaburu, Maun, or wherever, we have more 4G sites than any other network in Botswana covering everyone everywhere with a high-speed 4G experience. Get a BTC Mobile 4G SIM card at your nearest BTC shop. BTC. Live connected. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that presentation, which was quite detailed. A youth literacy rate of 98% and, and counting. I think that's something to be applauded. That and a policy governance uh, structure that is the most liberal in the region, I think we are all on our way for um, catapulting to the next generation of digital leaders. Now to lay the foundation for the conference, I will now call upon the Managing Director of the Botswana Telecommunications Re Anthony Masunga, who will take us through and outline the role of BTC as an, as an anchor to the Botswana digital agenda. Re Masunga. Um, good morning, everyone. What, what a beautiful day. Um, we've just had two powerful speeches from the Honorable Minister and uh, my, my board chair. Obviously, uh, they are the strategic torchbearers to BTC. I've already been introduced by, by, by the MC. Uh, it really is a great day for us. It's a great day in the sense that we are launching this event, an event of this magnitude, for the first time in Botswana. And as BTC, we cannot be even more proud. Uh, we would have loved a situation where we were interacting physically with yourselves as our audience, but uh, this is the new normal. We have to interact through the digital means. Uh, and obviously, let me just thank you for tuning in to our conference, which is going to last for two days. Um, the way I've structured my quick conversation with yourselves, I'm just going to give you a synopsis about just my company and why we are here, our philosophy and our purpose and the business that we are in and all the investments that we have done to date and, 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 and the future. 
Um, some of the areas have already been covered. I'll just give a bit of flavor uh, from myself as the MD. Um, common knowledge, BTC, we all know, it was established in 1980. We are a converged operator uh, listed on the stock exchange, as we speak, the only telco in Botswana to be listed uh, on the stock exchange. Annual turnover, uh, sitting at circa 1.5 billion. We employ around 1,000 people, and we work with and through partners, many, many partners, technology partners, local, uh, international, and you'll see them uh, um, through, throughout the two days. Uh, key sponsors, the likes of Bofinet, which is our own, our homegrown brand as well. So there are many, and we thank them for being part of this journey with ourselves. We are governed through a board of independent directors, and that comes with the uh, listing uh, requirements, and we are proud um, of that journey. The journey has already been shared with yourselves. Uh, it's a long journey, but very successful. Uh, we started off as a single brand, became multi-brand, introduced our mobile brand, our botnet brand. We have further conversed post-listing uh, through to a new brand, as you may see it on, on my screen there, uh, which pushes the slogan, the Live Connected, because we had to consolidate all the brands. And over the journey now, and in the past couple of years, since this, since 2016, we've been undergoing major transformation that positions our, ourselves to be a true, true, true digital partner. And we recently launched uh, the first, again, uh, the first uh, telco museum uh, in Botswana as part of our transformation journey. And to, to say to Botswana, we are there to, to, to save you. Our philosophy, what are we all about as an organization? Uh, we are saying we exist to serve our people. Uh, people are at the center of our mandate. BTC is a people-centric organization. And at the apex, really, the, the drivers of, the, of, of this company are really our employees. The employees are at the center of everything. We've got a 1,000 uh, strong uh, workforce, skilled, Different skills, engineers, computer scientists, marketers, salespeople, legal people, all driving value. And the value, we deliver the value to uh, a group of people called shareholders as well. <laughs> Those are beings. And uh, our shareholders, we exist to really create value for them. We also exist to create value for the community we live in because we really want to be a true corporate citizen. And that's what we've been doing all the 40 years as an organization. We also have our foundation, which is more of a charity organization where we really give back to the community that we live in. Uh, our customers are at the top as well. We deliver, and our customers come in many forms. It's our people, it's the community. We interact with them through the foundation, enterprise, government, and what have you, and, and we work with our partners. So our philosophy really is around driving people to excel. That's what BTS is all about. Uh, and to do that, we leverage on the technology investment uh, that we make uh, uh, in our organization. As, as I've said before, we really exist to provide superior communication solutions to our people, to, to enable them uh, to live connected. And uh, we couldn't, the, as you may have realized during the pandemic and today right now, because of the new normal, we are interacting virtually, as, as, as you may see right now, on your screens, through your phones, your laptops, and what have you. We want to in enable you to live connected and to work connected and to, to improve your productivity through the connectivity uh, investment that we've made and all the services that we've made. Just to give you a sense of our business, again, our business is structured. We are a consolidated operation, converged operator that drives mobile offers across all verticals, either to the mass market, to youth, to professional, to residential, or to the enterprise and government. As you may see on the screen, from the left to the right, that's what we drive. We also drive fixed services as well, through all the verticals again. Uh, uh, either it's your fixed line, your internet at home, or your VSET, which the minister referred to earlier on, about a VSET, which you can use at the comfort of your farm, in the middle of the CKGR, or wherever. Um, so this is what we're all about. Uh, the next line of our business is the digital service space, and this is exactly what we're going to be talking about for the next two days. Um, and through the digital services space, 
during the uh, during the pandemic, we have delivered smart education. Uh, products and services with our partners, the University of Botswana being one of them. Uh, the professor, Professor Doris, will be speaking today again about how we've been able to collaborate to deliver smart education. Classmate, developed by uh, Botswana, it's a service that we've delivered through our digital uh, our network. We deliver cloud services through our data center, self-service applications as well through our web portals and what have you. This is the space that we are moving in. FinTech, uh, my board chair also referred to that. Our Smega, which is a big hit throughout the country to enable people to do what I would call e-money, if you know what I mean. And it's an integrated world. As I'd said before, we exist uh, to deliver services to our people, to enable them to live connected. And this is the journey that we've been following. And this is, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the different, the different, the different lines of businesses that we pursue as an organization. The mobile space, the, the, uh, the fixed space, um, the digital space, underpinned by fintech, cloud services, and, and, and many others. The investments that we've made to date, uh, the chair also touched on those, and they range from your mobile broadband all the way to your service delivery platforms. At the end of the day, once you have built the connectivity and whatever, you, you need to have service delivery platforms to enable people to enjoy your content, to enjoy your services. And we, this is exactly why we support even government to build MGov, eGov, online services and the like, because this is what we're all about. The banking, uh, everyone interacts with our bank through a phone these days, and this is the technology. Uh, BTC's infrastructure enables that to happen. All the banks in Botswana actually deliver their services on our network. So that's how integral we are to the development of this country. Just to give you a sense of our coverage to date, that's our 4.5G. We're very close to 5G, and we've been driving it, as you can see, see on, your, on your screen there. It ranges all the way from Gokweng <laughs> to, to Charles Hill or Mamuno, from Shagawayo down to, to Box Pits or Middle Pits, or to, from Ramatabama to Ramukhebana throughout the whole country because we really want our people to live connected. And we want to give them the best service because it's central to connected living, really. If the service is not of high quality, then our people will struggle to interact through these technologies. Fiber coverage, we work with our partner again, Bofinet, to deliver fiber where we can. Um, in, in most of the localities, as you can see in Khaboroni, we've been aggressive in our fiber rollout to enable people to enjoy quality broadband services. This is where the world is going. We lay out this infrastructure to enable people to work. And you are enjoying this live stream right now purely because of the investments that we've made. And it's been through, I don't know, through sweat and pain and what have you, and tears and the like, through the 1,000 workforce that I spoke about. These people have been able to deliver all these things. Talented Botswana working with partners, international and local, to deliver value. And this is what we are all about as BTC. BTC VSET, this one, I, it's a killer with, uh, with, uh, with our farming community, our tourist facilities throughout the country. Um, you, and one of, one of our customers will be sharing some time today uh, our, that experience with our BTC, our VSET solution, as you can see on the screen, how they're able to, uh, to drive productivity within that farm somewhere in the Sandfeld, which is quite remarkable. So we, we are out there to work with all sectors of the economy to enable everyone to live connected and really create wealth at the end of the day. Because imagine uh, if you are unable to actually uh, see what's going on in a farm. I mean, you put one million investment in a farm and you, you, maybe you're based in Habro, you've got something else to do and you're unable to actually check out what's going on. It's a wasted investment. So we want our people, our economy to be a lot more productive. Centara Data Center, it's our pride and joy. This is, a, we deliver all our cloud services. Multinationals actually are hosted here in Botswana. The Facebooks of the world, the YouTube, they do use our tier two uptime certified data center to deliver services through Botswana. We all know if I were to challenge the minister over there, um, during the last political campaign, almost all political parties drove their campaigns through the digital means. They all had Facebook pages or Twitter pages and the like because this is the world where the world is going. And they couldn't have done that if you hadn't hosted these things locally 
and they couldn't have reached out to the masses. And this is a, a testament to the fact that if you build the right solutions for your people, then people will enjoy them and actually drive productivity in, in the country. So the, the, big, the million dollar question or the million pillar question is, why are we really here? Why are we here? We are here for the next two days, obviously, to bring the future into the present. Because we are actually living the future. As I speak right now, this is digital transformation at work. This is for IR at work. We will be traversing, we will be discussing those topics, technologies, services, connectivity, big data, data analytics, fintech, internet of things, cloud, and, and the Mutsuana, average Motswana at home, uh, don't be intimidated with all these big words. Um, the work of the experts throughout these two days is to decipher this information and deliver it in a more meaningful way to yourselves. And we will be talking to different case studies. B3 will be here to approach this whole area from a research perspective. But at the end of the day, we should answer one question. What's in it for Motswana and the world? As we talk about these technologies, are they really relevant? Are they creating value for our people? And for the next two days, I challenge everyone at home or everyone at their offices who's joining to enjoy this live virtual broadcast to just to pick just one idea that they can take with them and implement it within their own companies or homes or what have you to enable our country to move forward. This is what this thing is all about. And with that, I just want to thank you and ask you to really enjoy this journey with ourselves, uh, hosted by my most talented MCs, the two of them, Ohone and Giselle, the pride and joy of Botswana. So I just want to thank you and say thank you for listening. Let's enjoy this journey together. Thank you very much. Such an engaging presentation by the captain. Such an engaging presentation indeed by the captain of the ship that is driving BW's digital agenda. Anthony Masunga, BTC MD, thank you so much, sir, and congratulations on today's successful liftoff indeed. Well, now we fully exploit all opportunities and actively explore how much further it is that we can grow economically and otherwise. We have got to be systematically and objectively connected to everything around us, and that is the main driver of the digital shift that we need. Well, in this regard, let's now welcome to the stage the BTC COO, Mr. Aldrin Sivako. Connectivity. To fully exploit all opportunities and actively explore how much further we can grow economically and otherwise, we must be systematically and objectively connected to everything around us. This is the main driver of a digital shift that we need.
Thank you. My name is Aldrin Sivako. As introduced, I'm the Chief Operations Officer for BTC. I'm going to speak to you about shift connectivity, and I will be covering the journey that BTC has tra traveled towards transformation. I'll also touch on the partnerships that we, we have to support us in this uh, journey, and I'll also then look briefly at beyond connectivity, how the future looks like. Uh, as, as, as BTC as an organization, just like any other operator, uh, telco operator, we started in the early 90s with uh, data services being dial-up services and X25 packet switched networks where we're delivering speeds up to 9.6 kilobits per second. And then in 2004, BTC then introduced ADSL technology for residential customers as well as frame relay for businesses, which uh, was a packet switch technology as well at the time. And ADSL was delivering speeds just below one megabit per, per second to the homes and then frame relay delivering speeds up to two megabit per second. And in 2008, we went ahead and invested in mobile. That was the time we entered the mob mobile space. We started with 2G and a very thin layer of 3G technology. Uh, with 2G edge technology, we were able to deliver speeds up to 384 kilobits per second as per the standard. And with 3G, we were delivering speeds up to 3.6 megabits per second. And then in 2010, we then upgraded the ADSL network uh, to ADSL2, which was uh, able to give us speeds up to 8 megabits per second. Uh, to residential customers. In 2018, BTC then invested heavily in its uh, uh, mobile and fixed broadband networks. This was the foundation for our digital transformation agenda. We invested in the LTE network, which is uh, release 13 as per the 3G PPP standard, which is third generation uh, partnership project uh, 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 standard. We, we, in that standard, it covers uh, um, the IMS platform, which is the IP multimedia subsystem, which we, we also invested in, as well as a virtual evolved packet core network, uh, which is based on release 13. Now, we also had then the RAN radio access network, 4G radio access network, uh, which is FDD on 2100 rather 1,800 megahertz spectrum. Now, we, we also invested in the fixed broadband space by using the technology called fiber to the cabinet, uh, delivering speeds between four and 50 megabits per second. We also invested in a high throughput satellite, a VSAT solution, which covers the entire country of Botswana, providing connectivity to everyone and everybody wherever they are with giving them broadband experience. We also invested in a data center platform, uh, which I'm going to speak to in the next, in the next uh, uh, slide. Now, this, as I said, was the foundation for our digital transformation uh, agenda. Because at that time, we managed to move delivering speeds from the traditional eight megabits per second to up to 75 megabits per second on mobile, as well as up to 50 megabits per second on the fixed uh, broadband space. In 2019, we did other enhancements on the, on the network. Starting with the 4G network, we evolved this network to be able to deliver much higher speeds. What did we do? We implemented what we call carrier aggregation, where we we are able to deliver higher speeds on a sector. We also introduced a, a frequency refarming where we took advantage of spectrum that was underutilized under the traditional 2G network. We had to shift it towards the 4G network just to improve on download speeds. We also did uh, an overlay of TDD network, which is layer, uh, another layer of LTE on 2300 megahertz. In the quest to improve download speeds as well. And this is how we managed to reach speeds in excess of 100 megabits per second on, on a mobile device. We also improved our 
fixed broadband network when we introduce fiber to the home, which is a technology that we use uh, to deliver high-speed broadband. We also decoupled the access network. Uh, what we did here is we, looking at our heavy investment on the copper network, we had to forklift that, in, that copper infrastructure and replace it with fiber. And this is a program that we started with in 2019, all in the interest to deliver high-speed connectivity. And we were able to do that in Havaruni, specifically Gulf Estate, uh, Havaruni North, and other parts of Havaruni, where we are now currently able to deliver speeds up to 100 megabits per second. We also uh, improved the data center space by introducing, um, we actually fully kitted it by turning it into a traditional white space data center to a cloud, you know, fully kitted data center with full capabilities of providing a computing, a high, hyperscale computing in that environment. As, as you might be aware, this is something that you normally see in AWS, in Amazon, in Amazon space, data centers. But this is the capability that we had to bring on board into our data center to make sure that it's fully uh, kitted to provide a, a computing a, a capa capability. And in 2020, we continued then with uh, further enhancement uh, on, the, on the network, expanding the LTE network, and also ex expanding our decoupling uh, plan. And we, we had to do this, as you probably realize that now at this stage, we were fully uh, capable to deliver anything and everything to our customers, especially enterprise customers who would normally require high speed and very reliable connectivity. And in 2020, we actually stress tested this network, these infrastructures. And this happened at the time when COVID hit the country. Because now we saw uh, everyone had, were compelled to work from home or study from home. Now, with all the capabilities that we put in place in terms of the network, fixed broadband network, mobile broadband network, a hyperscale capability in the data center, we were able to host applications for students to be able to access lessons online. We were able to provide connectivity to employees of companies that needed to work from home. And we saw on, that, on the verge of the lockdown, uh, we saw our stores were, were um, uh, the, the many queues, people queued up just to get our services because they needed to ensure business continuity for their businesses. Now, how does the future look like? Our future as BTC starts 2021 and beyond. So what we are doing into the future is to leverage the investment that we have done, both on the fixed broadband, on the mobile broadband, and on the data center uh, platform so that we can build capabilities into the future, both for us as a company and for our customers. We intend to become a fully digital enterprise. That is where we are going. And we, we want to be a data-driven organization such that all our decisions will be made uh, through uh, 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 um, availability of data and at, at the click of a button so that we can make informed decisions speedily. We, we also are looking at, and we have been working since 2020, of course, uh, enhancing our security. This is infrastructure security. Uh, considering the fact that what we realized when we went into lockdown due to COVID, what we realized that was that there were an increase in cyber attacks. So we had to fortify our network infrastructure to make sure that it is robust against uh, the dark world. We also uh, have been working very hard to build those digital trust with our enterprises. We do have services in, in the data center. Security as a service is provided in there to make sure that anybody, any of our customer that wants uh, internet will not just get a native dark pipe, but rather a pipe that is enhanced with security because it is, it is becoming increasingly very important in this time and age. And as I said, uh, we have seen, and this is a global trend, of course, we have seen an increase in, in attacks. 
uh, 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 through cyber, on, on the cyberspace. And we are not leaving our customers behind. We are giving them support to make sure that they are not left behind as we modernize our infrastructure so that they can also um, modernize their platforms to become digital enterprises. What we are looking forward to is to become an AI-driven uh, organization in terms of our service operations environment because we do recognize that uh, if we don't go that space, uh, our efficiencies will be compromised. So we are looking at it to be an AI-driven uh, service op operator. And we are looking at open API kind of environment because we, we want to leverage on the, the available technologies to provide access to for, for easy integration with our partners that we are working, working with. We are also looking at research and development with partners that we have uh, because we recognize that the future of connectivity and the future uh, customer and the future operator uh, needs to, to be uh, one that is forward-looking, uh, considering the available te technologies that we have that we could leverage. And we have built, as I said, we have built uh, capabilities so far uh, that can help us to move into that future. And we are also looking at future technologies such as 5G, as well as to evolve our fixed network into the fixed 5G. And this is very, very important because now moving into the future, you would expect that there's going to be seamless uh, interaction between the fixed network and the mobile network, between the fixed fixed 5G network and the mobile 5G network. That seamless integration is very, very crucial and these are things that we're looking at into the future. Now, uh, just to mention some of the partners that we have in the academia, we also have got research partners uh, over and above what we, we have with uh, the partnership that we have with our vendors. We also have innovation uh, uh, partners, Innovation Hub as a partner, as well as the hyperscale service providers uh, the likes of Microsoft, uh, who are helping us, you know, to provide or deliver certain services such as um, uh, collaboration solutions, uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, Security as a Service, uh, Office 365. I spoke about uh, uh, Security as a, as a Service, uh, Software as a Service such as Office 365 that comes from Microsoft that we are currently delivering to our customers. And we also... Uh, having kitted the data center, uh, we have built in those capabilities. We also host all startups that have been incubated uh, by Innovation Hub, for example. We, 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 we offer them space, development environment, as well as hosting space for them to run their businesses, and as we have done with Classmate. And we also uh, uh, do research and development together with our partners. We do innovation and co-creation together with our partners. There are quite a number of, of things that we're doing with some of these partners and we'll soon bring them to market in the near few, few months or so. And what are our capabilities uh, in the digital space? As BTC, uh, our approach, uh, understanding that technology is very complex to our customers. We normally uh, provide advisory services to our customers to help them you know, understand their environment and then we can give them guidance as to what kind of solutions they need to consider uh, moving forward, whether it's from a connectivity point of view or solutions from a Microsoft licensing structure. Because what we have realized with many customers, especially enterprise customers and corporates, is that there is an oversubscription of Microsoft licenses and therefore they pay more than they need. So we assess the environment and give them an advice to say, you can consolidate these licenses so that you pay for what you need. You don't need to have all that, that you are currently keeping in your, in your IT uh, resources. Connectivity, we advise our customers uh, what kind of connectivity they need. Like I said, we have different options depending on the location of the customer, the kind of applications they run, and, and of course, the kind of services that they are going to run and the size of the organization. We provide uh, guidance as to uh, what kind of options they need to take, whether is it VSET or it's FTTX or it's a list line, and so on and so on. We also, uh, like in the data center space, 
we have different solutions out there. Uh, I spoke about security as a service that we are currently delivering. And for enterprises, what I would, advise to, I would advise them to do is that they should always insist because now uh, we don't want, we don't expect customers to get an internet pipe that is not secured because the moment you get a public IP address, then you are already in the public domain and you become a, a target for the dark world. Now, therefore, it becomes very, very important that you need to consider security as a service, as an imperative for your operation, especially if you get a public IP address. We also provide, as I said, collocation space to, to our customers. We provide development environment. The, this data center, as I said, is fully kitted with full computing power, storage, server, whatever that you can think of. Like I said, similar to what you get, you get in AWS. And fintech space, uh, we also offer this to our enterprises, especially if they want to do uh, bulk payments to, for staff, especially field, working, uh, field workers. This they can have access to, to through our Mozilla platform uh, for, for those who want to do uh, um, um, crowdfunding fund, or just salary payments uh, to, their, to their staff. We, of course, mobile is the space that we play in. And of course, we also provide managed services where we look at your environment. If you, you want to offload you know, all your ICT services, uh, all your IT, IT services, your telecommunication services, your corporate Wi-Fi, we can manage that for you. We have built that cap capability internally uh, in, 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 our, in our network, and all this is hosted in, in our data center. We also host your websites, of course, so that then you do not uh, 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 focus on other things but you, the, your core business. And we also offer collaboration solutions in, uh, as, as BTC. Now, what are we doing beyond connectivity? Beyond connectivity, we are looking at other services such as e-services. I spoke about uh, e-education. And we are also looking at, you know, uh, uh, for anti-poaching anti -poaching solutions, leveraging on a VSET solutions to to provide connectivity-assisted drone, uh, uh, drones, whereby now beyond visual line of sight, we are able to, to provide uh, connectivity-assisted connectivity you know, drones. So with, uh, with partnerships, we can um, support government effort in anti-poaching efforts you know, to provide that surveillance of, uh, of um, the, 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 the wildlife, of a, of a game. Uh, through the VSET solutions with, with drones uh, and main aerial vehicles, of course. And, of course, in e-health, in the healthcare, healthcare space, we are working with partners in that space as well to provide that support. We do have the environment which can host the applications. And, of course, we are also looking at e-tourism. Take, for example, the time when we were under lockdown as a country. Uh, the tourism sector was actually shut down. But... Uh, we do have capabilities, technology capabilities, to provide, and again, using unmanned area vehicles or drones or whatever you may call them, uh, with uh, connected, assisted, uh, uh, with connectivity assist assistance, uh, whether on 4.5G or VSAT, to provide your tourists with that experience, uh, uh, similar to a game drive experience, or a game viewing experience using drone at the comfort of their homes. And, and this will ensure that there's continuity in the tourism sector whenever there is limitation in, uh, in movement or restriction in movement. And of course, to in, we can, that can be enhanced through augmented reality where you now add on top of your standard uh, game viewing uh, through the use of, of that technology. You can augment it using augmented reality where you now you know, give the tourist more immersive experience of um, um, their game experience, virtual game drive or game viewing experience. And then future outlook with IoT, Internet of Things. We are looking at smart cities or, smart or connected homes, connected, connected communities. And this is very crucial now moving forward uh, because uh, um, with uh, the ubiquity of networks, ubiquity of networks, especially for 5G that is coming, uh, we expect 
devices, many devices to be, to be connected. And we also are looking at smart farming to support smart farming environments. Smart transport. Um, imagine, uh, uh, you know, during the time when we went into lockdown and somebody wanted to order a meal. And um, imagine that uh, the, the meal would be prepared by a robot and then it would be moved into a, a, an autonomous vehicle and this autonomous vehicle using GPS coordinates will get to deliver the meal at your house. Now this is very possible with technology, uh, especially internet or uh, uh, IoT based technologies and, and of course high latency, low latency and high speed networks to avoid collisions, especially for autonomous vehicles. And smart homes, for security purposes or just for the fact that you wanted to have complete visibility of your home. These are solutions that are possible now with the infrastructure that is in place, whether you are speaking about the cloud infrastructure that we have built, the FTTX network which gives you, you know, high speed connectivity or the 4.5G network which gives you that high speed connectivity or even the VSET, high throughput VSET which gives you that high speed connectivity. And of course, uh, we, we also look at the future, which is 5G, which is going to give us the, that uh, high throughput and uh, low latency connectivity. Now, the question is, because the future of the economy is going digital, are you ready? Are you ready? As BTC, we are well prepared. We are ready to support you as an enterprise. I thank you. Like breathing, connectivity is a basic human need. That's exactly why the UN has declared internet connection a basic human right. Especially in times like these, connection is what makes us grow. It gives us meaning and lets us be a part of something bigger than ourselves, part of a nation. Spacecom is proud to be a part of the effort to empower African nations to connect and very proud to present Digital Community Platform or DCP, a practical and sustainable solution to your country's digital transformation plans, including remote and less accessible regions. Combining connectivity, Wi-Fi, local cloud, content and OTT in a simple and innovative way. Using Spacecom's brand new and advanced satellite, AMOS-17, specifically designed for Africa's needs, DCP provides a turnkey solution, which enables a complete arsenal of services. Government services, health, education, commerce and payments, agriculture, and of course, use and entertainment. DCP, Digital Community Platform. Scalable, sustainable, flexible. Available now for rapid deployment. Welcome back. The success of innovation lies its inability to reach its intended audience and customers. Access. So therefore, connectivity plays a critical role as a driver to the digital shift transformation. Earlier on, Aldrin and Anthony did talk to uh, the Visa technology, which is, which is really looking at providing connectivity in far found places and uh, remote area connection. Just so that the innovation that we speak of can follow you everywhere you go. Calling in through video line, please welcome from Spacecom, Mr. Iran Shapiro, who's the director there.
morning, everyone, and thank you for having me today. And thank you, Audrey, for your uh, presentation. And I just remember how two years ago at the Digital Innovation Event, we were sitting together on the panel and discussing how we can bring uh, new solutions to uh, Botswana. And uh, I think today, after a very successful partnership over the last uh, three and a half years with uh, BTC, we are ready to move forward where uh, satellite communication and connectivity can play a role for business uh, critical application as well as all the remote communities. So here we go. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is how innovation, both in digital technologies as well as satellite-based connectivity, can now uh, actually allow us to extend sustainable development, uh, not just to the uh, urban and suburban area, but also to uh, underserved communities across Africa. So um, when we're talking about the digital shift for Botswana, what is it that we are actually after? If we will look uh, three months back, we can see that the Botswana government has actually uh, announced the approval of the uh, Smart Botswana program by the cabinet. And um, the strategy here is how to drive the digitalization of both the public sector as well as the private sector into a knowledge-based economy. And this is going to be done by using information and communication technology, or ICT, as the main driver for that economic uh, economical development. In order to, to reach that, uh, we can also see what the uh, Minister of uh, Higher Education, Research and Technology of Botswana uh, has actually uh, said at the same time that uh, in order to be able to uh, get to that point, we should do uh, some work because in the end, all those uh, countries that has been able to digitally transform has been able also to achieve much higher economical growth. And uh, the result, of course, is better service to the citizens and this is a really uh, a major part of the Botswana vision to 2036. Um, so let's talk about some of the key technologies that we're going to discuss in this session and later session during this uh, conference. Uh, some of them are uh, cloud and how access to the cloud enables us to uh, provide new uh, uh, and secure digital uh, services. IoT as the bridge between digitalization and connectivity. How big data analytics and artificial intelligence help us to better understand and make uh, informed decision based on existing and new data. And, uh, and this is just the technology. We also have the main type of services that benefit from these technologies. And these include uh, education, health, agrotech, and many more uh, type of applications and services that rely on these key technologies. On, but all these technologies really depend on one major infrastructure. And that infrastructure is connectivity. Connectivity is really the key for to be able to get to that economical development and social empowerment via the delivery of digital services. With no connectivity, we cannot deliver most of those digital services. So if we look at uh, uh, how uh, uh, COVID-19 is actually influenced us, connectivity and communication is, is, is highly essential especially in this time uh, for those uh, communities which are not near the main, uh, the main cities. Even the UN has acknowledged that and less than a half a year ago has actually issued, uh, uh, let's call it a wake up call based on the COVID-19 and how uh, the usage of uh, uh, communication and, and information technology should be harnessed to support uh, those uh, type of communities as the best protection against the impacts of COVID-19. 
This allows us to do better business and, and government services. It allows us to avoid the social isolation uh, uh, that is part of the impacts of COVID-19 and also elevate the risk of uh, those rural communities being even further isolated during such a pandemic. So um, is the infrastructure which we have now is, is enough to enable such uh, equitable and sustainable digital services to all? If we look at the uh, how people are actually spread out across the country, we have the main areas like the urban centers, which are usually quite well served. And we have the rural and the very rural areas that in terms of communication infrastructure, but not only, are not that well served. In an ideal world, we would like to have complete coverage of the country with high service availability and very low total cost of ownership. However, in reality, the urban areas where you have dense population and, uh, and high income usually guarantee good ROI, so all commercial communication and technology companies are present there. But once you go to areas which are very vast and the population are quite distributed across those areas and income is not as high, then usually these are not available. So um, the challenge is how we uh, serve those unconnected and underserved communities and avoid for the, them being uh, further behind in terms of the digital services that they can actually get. And connectivity is not the only problem. We have additional problems besides uh, co uh, connectivity. This is ICT infrastructure. This is the uh, constant and reliable supply of energy, an application that can be deployed in those remote communities uh, in a way which is both easy and cost effective and does not uh, uh, oblige us to invest a much higher portion of the national uh, uh, GDP in order to achieve that. So what can we do in order to, uh, to, uh, to address those issues? Uh, some of them rely to satellite uh, communication. We've seen a, a wealth of innovations coming in the, in the last few years in terms of both the satellite technology, how we can provide more uh, capacity, more throughput, and uh, get higher efficiency, on how the ground segment, the equipment on the ground that allows the connectivity to be uh, more efficient and more reliable, how the delivery of those services is now adopting end-to-end -end service architecture with vertical integration implemented in order to simplify the deployment and also new business models that allows cooperation between public and uh, private uh, sectors and how we, we can also look at uh, a bootstrap model or sharing model between public and private sectors. This is all part of the satellite communication uh, ecosystem progress made in the last few years that is actually helping us reduce significantly the OPEX required to connect a remote community. Uh, example of some of the uh, satellites available in the market today, we have a MO17 uh, KU band high throughput uh, spot beam over Botswana, used today by uh, uh, BTC. We have MO17 C band high throughput beams covering all of Sub Sahara. And we have also uh, KA band HTS spot beams covering multiple countries with other satellites. So the satellite technology is there. What is it that uh, we still miss? This is uh, on, on the ground. Uh, and uh, what we are uh, providing today is an overview of some of the innovations down in the integration between the satellite infrastructure of connectivity and the ICT infrastructure on the ground in order to deliver what we refer to as, as a digital community, community platform. So uh, what is it uh, all about? Um, it's basically, um, we think that this innovation is a game-changing concept on how we deliver uh, information and communication technology to uh, uh, remote communities. Um, 
we call it DCP, but uh, it stands for Digital Community Platform. And the idea here is how uh, one platform can serve multiple uh, digital services and application uh, that are required and desired in, uh, in those communities, uh, which are not available today or are not cost effectively available today. So how is it actually uh, looking like? We have, if you look at the middle of uh, these graphics, you will see uh, so some of the core components. It basically has four um, main uh, components and, or building blocks to it. First one is uh, relying on a very high uh, efficient uh, and high power satellite. Uh, the second part is installing per community uh, a shared local ICT infrastructure. It has m multiple building blocks that like a local cloud, storage, Wi-Fi access, and, and so on. On top of that, we have solution-specific elements, uh, which uh, in addition to software and application also have uh, dedicated hardware. For example, for a digital clinic, there are some uh, components in the clinic that allows it to be online completely. And in order to avoid the energy problem and unreliability in some of those remote communities, we have a very uh, cost-effective uh, solar power system that powers all of it. And on top of all of these, we have uh, uh, one of the advantages of satellite being utilized here. And this is the ability to broadcast a lot of content to all those remote locations while keeping the overall OPEX very low. Usually satellite communication is considered more expensive than terrestrial infrastructure and connectivity. But in this case, where you want to uh, uh, distribute a lot of content to those remote locations, satellite is actually more cost effective. If we will look a little bit more in details, you can see here in the middle, what is the shared infrastructure, all the components which are part of this shared infrastructure residing in the community, from the satellite uh, connectivity part to the local server and cloud, Wi-Fi access is the last mile to use uh, in order to get access to all those applications, and the solar power system, uh, which is optional, but uh, we've seen it in many places as, as mandatory. All of that is a shared infrastructure that application and digital services can run on top. It could be only for education, it could be for education and agriculture, it could be for health, media, and a government portal. And it's available for use by, by large communities, single users, uh, all of them using uh, mobile devices like uh, a phone or a tablet and, and so on. If uh, we will go a little bit uh, into details, what is it applicable for? So this is, uh, of course, applicable for many government services like border control and post offices and financial services uh, and any type of uh, fintech uh, uh, advances that are available. Uh, of course, we also have uh, education, uh, which is extremely important, especially during COVID and after COVID as we want to support e-learning platforms for remote learnings. We want to be able to provide equal opportunities and equal level of education across the country, and also to be able to monitor the progress of uh, the national educational programs across the country, see which areas need more support, and so on. So uh, the, the way this is structured, and if we will look at the uh, original uh, scheme of how the digital community platform actually work, we can dive in here a little bit more. You can see in the back end how in addition to the connectivity and the internet access, we can also uh, support the connectivity of uh, a private cloud like the education ministry. Uh, we can see how uh, we do content distribution using a cloud-based uh, system that uh, the local uh, ministry of education has access to and control and also third-party type of educational system. 
We also have a, a tiered type of solution. Some of them, uh, which are in the middle, are a full-scale type of community level or large sc regional school level that can support multiple classes. But we also have solutions which are much smaller in scope and could accommodate a very small remote community or even uh, someone learning at home. An example of an application is uh, a tablet or smartphone-based uh, application that uh, we already migrated to this uh, platform. Uh, this is uh, serving kids in the age of 4 to 14 with over 5,000 activities. The idea here is to how learning is made simple and uh, thrilling using some uh, games. It also allows us to have personal learning and meaning that teacher can assign different uh, uh, courses and different uh, stages per course, per student, and have complete analytics. And this can work both online and offline. So if a student has a smartphone or a tablet that he takes with him to school, he is connected whilst at school, and whilst he goes home, he can continue the course and the progress at home. And the next day, when he gets back to school, being online again, everything is synchronized. So this is an example how the uh, um, integration between the connectivity layer and the application and the overall information uh, technology is being made to use in order to make uh, learning both uh, a more appealing uh, experience as well as something that has a full uh, control by the teachers and by the Ministry of Communication. Um, the same thing goes to agriculture. You know, when you go to agriculture, we will talk later today, uh, later today how IoT can be used for uh, agriculture. Uh, but in the end of the day, in order for IoT and uh, other uh, information available for farmers to be effective, you need the, the communication. And in our case, this is residing on top of the digital community platform. Uh, and an example of an application we have here is uh, also a smartphone or a tablet application that the farmer can use to take a picture of uh, his field or uh, a specific plant with a disease or a pest. And we have here additional intelligence built into the application that is doing some local uh, uh, processing and analysis, providing initial results to the farmer. And at the same time, we use the satellite connectivity to the cloud in order to load that information, uh, alert other farmers in the area in case this is uh, something that can affect multiple people, uh, multiple farmers or multiple regions, and uh, also provide the farmer himself additional insights in terms of what is the right uh, way to deal with this uh, disease or this uh, pest. Another example of how communication infrastructure is integrated with specific uh, knowledge base, big data and analytics in order to provide the value to those people in uh, remote communities without the need for heavy investment per community. Additional applications which are uh, residing on top of uh, the digital platform is, uh, of course, commercial services that can be made available. We have uh, media and entertainment, including the delivery of large-scale OTT services in remote location. So if the government has specific uh, uh, channels uh, that it wants to be available using IPTV, uh, that's also possible here. And uh, the last one we can talk about is the medical services. You can see an example in the background of a picture taken from such a digital clinic that we have implemented uh, with a lot of services available on site and uh, with remote uh, online consultation. The system actually has two parts to it. It has uh, the back end that you can see here on the left hand side. Uh, with the uh, security infrastructure because uh, medical records, of course, must uh, adhere to the highest uh, 
information security standards on one hand, and at the same time, you want uh, uh, remote uh, locations to be able to enjoy support from experts, and this could be done with an online consultation on one hand. On the right-hand side, you can see the different components residing within the community where you have actually um, a laptop or a tablet in, in that digital clinic with all the uh, sensors and uh, um, diagnostic tools co electrically connected via Bluetooth or directly to that end device and providing a lot of uh, information and uh, an analytics and diagnostics done locally, uh, things which were not be were able to be done uh, earlier and uh, also saves the need to send someone to a very remote uh, hospital and not being diagnosed quickly uh, on site. Uh, if we go a little bit more into details, this is a portable diagnostic kit. It has a lot of uh, tests available, uh, both blood test, urine test, uh, physical test, and, and so on, on, on one hand. And also at the back end, we have a very easy uh, and intuitive to use uh, platform that, re that relies on a cloud-based uh, electronic medical record system with a, an EMR that can uh, provide very secure uh, infrastructure. Uh, it actually follows everything that has to be done from the patient registration when arriving to a clinic to all the diagnostics parameters available online and uh, also the ability to connect to experts at remote location to be able to provide better level of uh, medical services. And um, the diagnostic tools that I mentioned earlier bring, can bring to those remote uh, digital clinics the type of uh, solutions which are usually found only in the main cities. Uh, we can demonstrate uh, how low power X-ray system can actually now be used working off a solar uh, power system. This is something new for Africa and we are feeling very fortunate to be able to, uh, uh, able to install it. We also demonstrated in, uh, in the picture you see in the back how also uh, medical staff, which is uh, not very experienced, can still use on at the site uh, ultrasound with the remote uh, uh, instruction of an expert and see the result uh, at the remote location, analyzed and being then being given to the local uh, medical staff all the instruction on how to handle this patient. So all, all of it uh, together, when we're trying to summarize it, is uh, this digital community infrastructure is something that uh, we, we worked with multiple partners. It's very scalable, it's highly sustainable, which is the critical aspect here, because usually projects can start with some financing uh, by the government or by uh, third parties. But the key here is how you want the ongoing costs to be as low as possible. And this is where the, these innovation in the technology, both on the satellite side and in the ICT side, translate to being sustainable. So um, I think when we want to summarize all of that and see how this translates to what we want to achieve today, I think uh, uh, we think uh, that this can help us drive the new ICT. This is going from information and communication technology to how integrated communication and technology can help us deliver those digital services to those living outside of the uh, main cities. I hope uh, uh, you find it interesting and between BTC and Spacecom, we are thrilled to be here today and uh, talk with you how we can support you going forward. Thank you. Hi. A lot of organizations are really good at fortifying their network infrastructure from a cybersecurity perspective. 
But the migration to work from home has presented not only uh, you know, potential uh, gaps and blind spots in, 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 in the cybersecurity landscape of these organizations, but also landmines that could lie somewhere up ahead. To talk to us about this phenomenon, we have uh, Mr. Conrad Stein from Cisco dialing in through video link. Good day. I'm Conrad Stein, CTO and Head of Engineering for Cisco's Sub-Saharan Africa. Today we're going to talk about Cisco's secure remote worker office. The trend to a more distributed workforce continues to grow and we all know this will continue to rise over the coming years because of the current pandemic. A recent study shows that at least 56% of the US workforce are able to work remotely. 43% of employees were working from home in 2019 already. The study also projected a work from home increase of 83% for 2021. Working from home delivers many benefits for employers and their employees. The four main areas are lower overhead costs as there are lower real estate costs, lower employee costs due to reduced costs for travel, parking and food expenses, maintain business continuity as businesses can keep operating as their workers work from home. Higher productivity and efficiency as employees now spend less time commuting and save an average of 11 days per year from commuting. I think we can all relate to this and agree that there is a compelling case for work from home. But we know with the pros, there's always some new concerns that business owners or leaders may not be prepared for. We now have our whole workforce of sight. How can we verify people are who they say they are when they log on? How do we defend against malware and other threats? And how do we keep people feeling connected when they are physically away from their peers and teammates? We know that's important. Why does it feel so complex to have to use all of these security tools? Can't they just work together? May we not have been planning for a sudden need in work from home during this pandemic expansion. But while we are trying to figure out how to support work from home, our employees are just trying to do their jobs and they're not aware that they may be exposing their employers to more risk. They're probably toggling between company managed devices and personal devices. They may not be aware of what device posture means. They could be using an out of date internet browser, for example. They're using more software as a service based applications and unsanctioned applications so they can just get their work done. So the clock is ticking as we try to figure out how we are going to secure our remote workers. So far, all types of businesses, you have a few considerations here. First, we have to verify the user's identity so we can establish trust. You are who you say you are. Next. We need to enable work on any kind of device, any kind of connection, but do it so in a secure fashion. We have to give access to the company applications and data. We have to protect them from threats once they're on the network. And wouldn't it be great if we could do all of this with a single integrated platform? At Cisco, we have a set of integrated solutions that can do exactly that. The Cisco SecureX platform is a built-in experience embedded within our solutions, meaning you see immediate benefits from the Cisco security products you already have deployed. We built SecureX to eliminate the complexity we saw across the security vendor market and make security simpler. SecureX expands platform benefits across every network, endpoint, cloud, and application. You can verify user identity, enable secure access, and defend against threats. <clears throat> and we can secure users wherever they need to work on any device through our multi-factor authentication solution, VPN, Cloud Edge, and endpoint security. And through our suite of web collaboration tools that further support workers when they're away from the office, keeping them connected to their home office and teammates. These offerings are backed 
by a world leader in technology. With the integration we've done across all of the solution sets, the Cisco SecureX delivered from the cloud. So now we're going to take a sneak peek at each of the four solutions, starting with Cisco Duo. This is the world's easiest, most secure, multi-factor authentication tool. Duo is incredibly easy to deploy across all types of applications, be it cloud or on-premise. You can verify user identities, gain visibility into every device, and enforce adaptive policies to secure access to every application. For the users, it's one tap approval from a really simple push notification on the phone to tokens, phone calls, text, wearables, and more. And we think the easier we can make it for employees to verify identity, the more we can minimize shadow IT. The Zero Trust approach secures access to everything across your entire network. It allows you to prevent a data breach before it happens by enabling policy-based controls to every access attempt to your application, workload, and network. Duo delivers on zero trust for your workforce by verifying identity and device health before allowing users to connect to the applications they need to do their daily jobs. Let's take a look at Cisco AnyConnect. If we delve into it, First, with Cisco AnyConnect, you can quickly give remote access to workers anywhere. It's secure access to the enterprise network from any device at any time and in any location. Next, you get more insight into users and endpoint behavior with full visibility across your entire network. Lastly, you get comprehensive protection from continuous endpoint posture checks. That's AnyConnect validating the health of the device you've granted access so that users are defended against threats wherever they go. Built on foundational VPN technology, AnyConnect extends its value proposition beyond remote access. AnyConnect enables security in the network fabric behind the firewall and provides unprecedented security and corporate policy enablement when users are mobile or outside of the corporate firewall. AnyConnect also integrates with several of Cisco's best-in-class security solutions, such as Secure Endpoint and Identity Services Engine. And there are many, many advantages that these products bring to AnyConnect. You can feel confident that AnyConnect has you covered with proactive protection, even without getting into the other solution components that integrate into Cisco AnyConnect. Let's take a deeper dive into Cisco Umbrella and Secure Endpoint. We call Umbrella a first line of defense because it works at the DNS layer with a goal to block threats before they compromise your data. With Umbrella, customers can also stop malware infections earlier, identify already infected devices faster, and prevent data exfiltration. As a secure internet gateway, Umbrella also provides visibility into your internet and web traffic, whether users are on or off your corporate network, across all ports and protocols. Protection from external threats, leveraging threat intelligence from Cisco Talos, and control of what your users can do to help with policy and compliance mandates. That's Umbrella acting as a first line of defense. But what about the small percentage of more advanced threats that sneak through? Let's take a look at those. Secure Endpoint is a cloud-managed, next-generation endpoint security solution that not only prevents cyber attacks, but also rapidly detects, contains, and remediates malicious files if they evade the defenses and infiltrate endpoints before damage can be done. Together, these solutions help companies protect against blended threats that use both email and web and other more sophisticated techniques. So hopefully, as you've seen now, this is a bundled set of offerings that comes with integrations and protects users everywhere. From the time we verify user and device identity with Duo to the time we enable access to the network and company applications with AnyConnect to that first and last line of defense we just talked about with Umbrella and Secure Endpoint. We've also got our collaboration platform, WebEx Cloud, that can keep your remote workers feeling connected and productive when they are away from the office. And we can do that in a secure fashion.
So let's do a quick look at how some of these key integrations work. We're just going to focus on three of the top ones for now. Cisco integrates design, protects users everywhere. Geo comes with native integration into Cisco AnyConnect and our Cisco NextGen firewalls. Duo provides the easiest to use multi-factor authentication solution for any Connect VPN logins. With Duo's multi-factor authentication, users can validate their identities with one-tap authentication. Duo with any Connect can provide admins with insights into devices and their security posture. Now, what that means is that we're checking for device health and enforcing policies to allow access to internal applications only from secure and healthy devices. The key benefit here is the fact that the two provide insights into unmanaged devices, as you're probably seeing a rise in that if you have a sudden rise in your remote worker force. Let's take a look at another key integration for Cisco AnyConnect. AnyConnect has a whole suite of modules for deploying security features that we call enablers. When the user's VPN into the network using AnyConnect, the secure endpoint module checks to see if the machine has a secure endpoint installed. If not, it enforces the installation. Any connect can enable the distribution of secure endpoint to remote users to help detect and stop advanced threats. These capabilities help IT streamline security operations for a range of users, employees, partners, contractors, as well as endpoints. And at last, we're going to take a look at how Umbrella and Secure Endpoint work together. They work in similar fashion as any Connect and Secure Endpoint, by first blocking a threat and then tracing down the root cause of the problem on the endpoint. That is that first and last line of defense we talked about earlier, where we block threats first at the DNS layer with Umbrella, then perform even more detection and response analysis on endpoints through the advanced malware protection we have in Secure Endpoint. So it's a very symbiotic relationship between these different solutions, which can provide protection on their own, but also do more than that together. So these are solutions that work together, as you see on the slide, where we're showing each of the four solutions in action, starting with a multi-factor authentication with Duo on the phone, moving to the VPN access with AnyConnect, and those first and last lines of defense from Umbrella and Secure Endpoint. There are solutions that stand alone or work together. As part of our broader approach to security, it's built on our SecureX platform, intended to work with what you already have and give you more control over your security efforts. It's user-friendly, security they don't have to think about, but it's more in the background, doesn't get in their way, and is truly frictionless. It helps you stay ahead of the constantly evolving threats out there, so you can focus on your business. And behind it all is an aggregated industry-leading threat intelligence, Cisco Talos. It is the largest non-governmental threat research organization on the planet, an elite group of security experts devoted to providing superior protection to our customers. We believe that you can't protect what you can't see. So we see more threats, more malware, more attacks than any other security vendor in the world. When you see more, you can block more. And we're proud of the industry recognition we've received, not only for enterprise and Fortune 100 companies, but for businesses of all sizes. As you can see, Cisco is here to help. Thank you for attending my session today. Hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you, goodbye. To expand on the capabilities of enterprise security, I'm going to be calling in a second on the video line, Mr. Paul Williams from Fortinet. I do hope that Conrad hasn't taken Mahokwa Rawe. Paul?
Good morning, everyone. Thank you. So uh, my name is Paul Williams. I'm the country manager for SADC and Indian Ocean Islands. And today I'll be presenting to you on the 40Net managed security service provider solutions that we currently are working with BTC on. Um, so that said, let me stop my presentation. So Fortinet today is a multi-global company. Um, we basically have been doing cybersecurity since 2000. Um, we are a leader in the cybersecurity business today, delivering uh, integrated and automated cybersecurity solutions, uh, specifically around the security fabric, which I'll lead into my presentation later. Um, with that, uh, we also recognized by Gartner in a number of different segments. Um, for example, we've been uh, with Gartner and leading the Gartner quadrant with the network firewall solutions, um, as well as the SD-WAN uh, or WAN edge infrastructure solutions. We also recognize with regards to wireless LAN and SIEM. Um, there's also been a challenger market where we've been playing with web application firewalling as well as endpoint protection. Um, with that, we see a huge threat in that space as well, where people are attacking uh, the specific endpoint solutions. With now, we have a large um, sum of people working at home from a COVID point of view. We term this as teleworkers in the space today. And these teleworkers are now becoming more and more vulnerable to these types of attacks at home, as well as the internet connections at home as well. So that's important that we actually look at this definition of how we actually protect these endpoints these users and devices um, from being attacked um, from things like malware, uh, other things like you know, control, command and control, etc. Um, over and above that, the other magic cottons we compete in is um, the secure web gateway. Um, with that, we also look at the indoor type of location-based services. Uh, um, and over and above that, we actually work very, very closely hand-in-hand -hand with Gartner around things like network access control, your things like your endpoint protection, your two-factor authentication. Um, and then the next step that customers are asking us for is how do we define and determine what zero trust network should look like and how we obviously interface those into the core of the network as well. 14 years scope for uh, corporate research responsibility also is definitely uh, an important factor. Um, us innovating the safe internet is one of our key milestones in the company. Um, definitely prov providing and increasing the work activity of cybersecurity skills in the marketplace in Southern Africa, as well as globally, is very important. So we have a large influence of uh, what we call certified training of academies uh, around South Africa and Africa, uh, defining these skill sets, increasing these skill sets, and obviously uh, bringing these skill sets into the corporate governance of companies to drive more cybersecurity um, intelligence. Over and above that, we obviously respect the environment. We have a large, um, you know, we try and also increase um, the throughput and the capacity throughput of our devices, but at the same time, look at becoming more energy efficient inside of those products as well. The industry landscape uh, is changing today. The customers have uh, obviously seen large impacts of, you know, people working at home. Corporates have now started basically providing their workforce uh, or been working at home due to COVID. We're also seeing the increase of remote workers accessing the networks, accessing the cloud services. Um, we've seen a large implication of uh, people being attacked at these edges and these perimeters of the network. Um, a, lo a large amount of uh, prolific uh, attacks and vulnerabilities have taken place in the last two years, since 2019. We've seen an increase of over 304% of these users being attacked. Um, data privacy has become an imminent part of this discussion. So when you obviously talk to um, companies like BTC, this is a definite question that you should be raising with the regulatory compliance in that country as well. And we obviously work with each of the compliance functions in those countries when dealing with types of things like this. That said, um, there's a huge emphasis today on protecting users on 5G and LTE networks, um, looking at how we define and uh, protect those edges of the network because this is a huge problem with all customers facing this uh, prolific, uh, you know, what we call the road warrior when they're uh, operating around the network and defending this network. And then over and above that is the threat landscape, which is becoming more and more broader, more and more um, f open function. Uh, and also this, this becomes a huge problem when people are using more than one device in their network today. 
So that said, end-to-end uh, -end protection is important, no matter if it's a user, device, application, all the way from into the data center, all the way to the cloud and to the edge as well. So we have to ensure that we protect all these components um, as a single solution architecture. So that said, we are seeing more and more sophisticated threats becoming um, more prominent. You know, we're looking at things like ransomware, you know, malware becoming uh, more and more clever the way they attacks the network. The digital attack surface is becoming uh, broader and wider, okay? And this is the important part to remember because with that said, you know, not every user carries one device anymore. We're carrying up to three devices. Um, we're also now accessing multiple applications, not only in the network of the data center, but also in the cloud. Um, the access systems are becoming more complex because multi-vendors have to start working together. And this is also a big issue when we have uh, not enough skilled people in the world. And global compliance. Go compliance, no matter if you're dealing in a single country or globally, we have to all comply to that. So all these elements um, have to be a discussion when we talk about risk incident and governance structures. So Fortinet's mission for ourselves is to ensure we secure people, their devices, and their data everywhere. Um, with that, we take into three considerations of categories. We take into the security-driven network elements. We take into zero trust access of the network. And we also look at how cloud technology can be more adaptive to people's users, uh, their networks, and the applications. And this is becoming the, I think, the crux of the matter where everyone wants to manage these types of networks, but on a single pane of glass. So no matter if you're dealing with an IoT or an OT type environment or a single device or a multiple of devices in a network, the functionality has to be easy, has to be agile, and has to be user friendly as well. So Fortinet has introduced the Fortinet security fabric. Um, the security fabric itself um, is a very broad type solution. It's not a point product. With that said, we basically take the attack surface. We look at all elements of the network. We look at the integration of those elements inside the network and we form a solution. That uh, is driven mainly by the Forti operating system. We also bring in things like Zero Trust, your adapt adaptive cloud technology and security. Um, we have elements with regards to the knock and sock elements where users can actually, um, information can be sent up to a northbound interface to have more visibility. And then over and above that is we have a large development team of over 420 different vendors we actually work with in our open Econet system. So with that, we are actually seeing a huge push now with uh, Forti SASE, or what's better known as Secure Access Service Edge, where all these types of internet services are coming array, and people are now wanting more security around those types of devices with applications and users accessing multiple applications, e-commerce, um, government, uh, large enterprises, small enterprises, government, et cetera, wanting more security at the access edge. And this also entails the, the functionality of mobile operators too, looking for more function and security at those perimeter edges and to the, uh, ra the radio edges as well. So the platform uh, we bring today is the, so the security fabric. We have many, many elements in the security fabric today. Uh, we have things like your security uh, services within the user place. We have regards to the management inside the, the center. So sorry, the management center, which is known as the SOC. Um, we have a large implementation of products around the 40 manager and the cloud offering. Um, open Econet, which I'll touch on in a, bit, a few minutes in my presentation. And then a large uh, function that customers are asking us for is zero trust because nobody can be trusted anymore. And this is obviously said tongue in cheek sometimes. But I think even large corporations now are basically vetting every user that comes to the network and every application that comes to the network because the importance is you've got to really challenge this application or user and actually find out what they want to do in your network as well. So that is becoming a large discussion point, um, no matter which organization that you talk to today. And with that, we also do security-driven network implementation, as well as bring a large complement of solutions with um, adaptive cloud security and work with multiple parties like Microsoft, um, Amazon, uh, Taliban, and all the many others like Oracle, cloud to define these services and build security into those cloud services as well. The fabric connectors ourselves, uh, like I said earlier, we are working with multiple vendors. This gives you a clear indication of who our open ecosystem partners are. And why do we do that is because Fortinet knows is we can't provide all solutions to everyone. So that is the main purpose of this, is developing these connectors, developing these open programming interfaces, 
um, obviously ensuring that the Dev DevOps teams protect and obviously service these uh, connectors correctly. We ensure we do proper testing uh, before we actually make them up public and also ensure we provide extended, uh, extended ecosystem partner testing as well when we're working with many other network elements like switching, wireless LAN, uh, cloud architecture, um, for example, and other governance types functions as well inside corporate companies. Um, part of our solution set is part of the 40 guard labs teams. Uh, we have over 560 developers worldwide that sit and what they do is they categorize the network. This is really the Fortinet's intellectual property and uh, the hardening of all our solutions. So this team basically builds um, and works with the 40 operating system team developers. We ensure that we work with many, many parts of, uh, you know, things like enforcement partnerships, we work with trusted partners. Uh, we ensure we incorporate all elements of telemetry inside the network. And over and above that is when you actually subscribe to Fortinet, uh, Fortinet services today, this is actually the bread and butter that actually makes that definition well. Uh, that is a huge um, drive with regards to artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, detecting and determination with regards to endpoint, uh, ensuring that the SOC and lock um, has complied to all the latest uh, governance structures that the corporate drives, and ensuring that even if a service provider like BTC is driving um, SOC and lock services, is that this element is protected by 40 guard services on the back end. So digital security is everywhere. I think we need to take uh, cognizance that as we uh, we have to build the stability and obviously ensure that customers um, drive this service and obviously incorporate it. Um, we'd all driven uh, obviously based out of um, head office in California, but every division inside each country has a prominent respect and uh, a trusted advisor to the company to actually help you build these services too. So thank you very much for your time and uh, appreciate your listening to the session. Thank you. Have a good day and stay safe. Thank you very much, Paul. So connectivity as an enabler of innovation permeates quite uh, seamlessly into also the, the dissemination of curriculum and education, even more so now with the adoption, the wide adoption of e-learning. Coming on stage to speak about e-learning and connectivity, please welcome Professor David Norris from the University of Botswana. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about the value of connectivity in an e-learning environment. ICT is highly sought in the world of training and learning. We've seen that there's a transition now towards e-learning mode of instruction and knowledge acquisition. When we speak of e-learning, we are really talking about the acquisition of knowledge which takes place through multiple technology and internet-based learning platforms. Why e-learning? There are a number of reasons and actually advantages for going or transitioning into an e-learning mode. It's accessible at all times. That is if the infrastructure is in place. It can be used anytime and anywhere. That is the learning can take any time. It can be done anytime and anywhere. There's also ease of update of information. New knowledge is created, and therefore, there's always a need to revise and review this knowledge. So it's easy with e-learning to update information. There's also what you call hypermedia delivery, which allows a user to search for us for, 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 for associated information through these hyperlinks is a non-linear mode of instruction. It's also self-paced. The learner can learn at his or her own pace. There's self-directed learning, essentially. It also supports what you call constructivist 
approach in learning and teaching. This is very, very important, especially we have to develop critical thinking skills in our students, problem uh, solving skills in our students, because it supports collaborative, interactive, and student-centered learning. It also enhances active learning and enhancement, as I said before, of complex thinking skills. Learners build their own meaning and understanding from the learning circumstances. What are the current trends? We are now observing decrease in investment in print materials and in the opposite direction, an increase in investment in digital materials. Many institutions of higher learning now subscribe to different e-learning resources. Training of students to fit into the global ICT world and give them avenues to reach out to the international community for both educational and employment opportunities. We've seen that in, in, on the rise. Infrastructure and connectivity are highly critical in supporting this e-learning. Where there is slow or limited connectivity, there's an adverse effect on students' ability to succeed in an online learning environment. Reliable internet connectivity is an ongoing concern for most people around the world. And this is particularly true in the developing world, such as Botswana. There are a number of connectivity issues, and this is not only limited to what I'm going to state. Dropped internet connections, poor audio or quality, poor audio or, 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 or video quality, inability to access learning materials, bad internet coverage, too many simultaneous users usually would slow down, connectivity, and of course there's also poor access during peak hours. So these are all the challenges that learning in an online environment uh, uh, creates. The United Nations' fourth sustainable development goal talks about inclusive and equitable quality education and promotion of lifelong learning opportunities. This is really to say education has become a basic right and therefore is really, really critical that teaching and learning reaches everybody everywhere. And therefore, internet connectivity has a fundamental role in achievement of this United Nations fourth sustainable development goal. And lack of access to the internet, that is internet with sufficient bandwidth, is critical really to development of a knowledge society, to the development of an information society. What are therefore the priorities for internet and education? The infrastructure, as I mentioned, and access are highly, highly important. The broadband infrastructure, critical. According to the 2017 estimates, 30 fixed broadband subscriptions, there are 30 fixed, or at that time, there were 30 fixed broadband subscriptions for every 100 people in European countries, but less than one per 100 in the sub-Saharan Africa. And I think this is now becoming a policy issue for governments in developing countries. There's a need for establishment of legal and regulatory frameworks that can encourage investment in internet infrastructure. The national research 
and education networks, what you call entrance, should be exclusively included in the national broadband strategies and universal access programs. In summary, really, what are we saying? We are saying connectivity allows for collaboration and interaction for meaningful teaching and learning. Connectivity allows for creation of communities of practice in learning. And as I end my presentation, connectivity and increased bandwidth is a non-negotiable service in e-learning. I thank you. I trust you continue to be challenged and thought provoked by the engagements that are ongoing from our expert speakers. I'm going to implore you to please interact with this, uh, this, this, this session, with all the sessions that are ongoing by going onto our website and going to the chat box and logging your questions. Now I'm going to call to the stage Mr. Richard Vaca, who's going to give us a case study on the VSAT connectivity. Botswana Beit, we've never seen Botswana like this. We've never seen the world like this. While you're at home, at BTC, we are doing everything we can to keep you connected. We have teams working around the clock, and more than 400 4G sites across Botswana. Right now, we are helping more and more Botswana to learn, collaborate, and work from home, minimizing the impact of COVID-19 on our lives. Wash your hands regularly, stay home, and stay safe. Yes, uh, this is a short presentation on doing business in remote areas using VSAT. VSAT is really for, I think it's a small satellite. First of all, I want to actually say, talk about this digital divide. What was life like before VSAT? In order to appreciate the benefits of VSAT, I think we need to understand life before. So. Uh, Gakai Range, this is where the visit is. It's about 117 kilometers from Letlakani, which is, and then 18 kilometers from the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. I think it's probably one of the most sparsely populated regions in the world. There's absolutely no infrastructure. When we say there's no infrastructure, I mean that there's no power. Access is strictly, and I mean strictly four by four, capable vehicles you know, navigating heavy Kalahari sands. There's no network, not even a single bar. Nearest settlement is Kidia, which is 75 kilometers away. So critical farm supplies are mostly from Gaborone, Francis Town, or South Africa. Other supplies can be sourced from Letakani. Going to the farm is saying goodbye to modernity. You are cut off from the world as we know it. In other words, I mean, talking to other people outside other than the people who are at the farm. Radio reception is poor. So you don't have any of this FM, GAPS F4, Moivin RB, RB2. You only get reception for shortwave and medium wave. Also at some times, you know, which means you probably can get your RB1, which is the only radio station you get locally, or maybe sometimes BBC World. The only useful functionalities in a cell phone is the torch and the camera. Other than that, really, it's a useless gadget. I think it sounds idyllic, but not if you live there and you have invested millions and you have got no way of monitoring and getting regular feedback. When I say getting feedback, sometimes you get there, you find something worth five pillar. 
it's breakdown, but we didn't even know. You only know when you get there. And then you've got to make a trip of 117 kilometers to go and get that. You know, probably spend 500 pula just on fuel. When you try to sell cattle, which is the main source of income, you transport on small trucks because there's no big truck that can go there because of the heavy calharisons. These small trucks that are prone to break down, to getting stuck on rough terrain, and there's no way of knowing. I once lost Fox, and I only realized two days later when he said, ah, these guys have not come back, because that's the only time you'll know if there's a problem. And also, just maybe for interest predators, a big problem. Historically, lions, leopards, wild dogs, hyenas, both species, cheetahs, and main, now the main problem is elephants, you know. So the decision was, what can we do? Let's try to find something that can come a solution. There were satellite telephones, the ones that we carry along, but you know, they were prohibitively expensive and they've got limited functionality. What I mean is only you, you carry one or you need another handset for the guys at the farm. You know, how much money are you going to spend that? It was too expensive. And then the people were talking about something that can enhance the cell phone signal, but you know, there's no signal to be enhanced. And then I went to the cellular phone providers, including BTCL at the time, they said they would provide anyone in Botswana. They said, bring us the GPS point. When you get to those GPS points, they say, ah, this place is too far, it's too sparsely populated, and really we can't extend the network, it's not viable. And then some people say there's this thing called Roger Roger, we call it Roger Roger, you know, radio communication. But it's not practical, you know. It means you've got to put something in the house and something, something there, the guys have got to come. Uh, for me, it didn't work for me. But you know, in life, I don't know, so those of you who like movies, uh, James Bond movie, I mean, say never say never. Keep on searching. Because, and hope that the solution. And indeed, the solution was VSET. I'm not sure how I came about. I think I was looking at the BTC website and I learned about this thing. And it didn't really take me much time to say, let me try this. And once VSET was installed, the world literally changed. And I mean, this was a step change. This was a major change in a place where there's absolutely no communication. So you couldn't dream that you get all the services that were only a dream for remote areas. They became a reality. I mean, what do I mean when I say they really? You know, you're communicating with people at the farm, your reports of borehole breakdowns, required supplies, left. I mean, I remember one of my neighbors, he said, yeah, I'll pay you 100 pula a month so that my guests can come and report if there's a problem. <laughs> That's how, you know, communication it, it is. And for livestock details, I don't know, for those of you who know, the guys can now tell you what's happening if you want, to, because you know, I mean, it's unlimited discussions. I mean, there was once a very prime bull that actually got fractured. The guys will take a video, send it to me, I send it to the vet, the vet can assess, and if it's a sick animal, they would actually describe the symptoms, then you can talk to the vet, and they can actually prescribe remotely. And then you can actually use base without leaving the system. This is the traceability system. You know, in order to sell cattle to the EU, you've got to be compliant. And this, this requires, unfortunately, this base system. And the people who do the compliance, they'll keep on regularly asking you to provide medications, the vaccines you have done. Then you can just email, either scan and send an email, and then, you know, they don't even have to come. And if you want to sell, you don't actually have to go to Lethakani and talk to BMC and try to find to go to an internet cafe. You just email BMC for a quota, this is, and they send you back the quota. Once they've actually slaughtered, they send you the slaughter details, which will know how much they owe you, how much you've spent, I mean, how much they owe you. You know, it's, it's just like you would be doing in town. And also, if you want to buy a bull, Especially in these times of COVID, you don't have to go there. You can actually, once you've got an app, you know, Meerkat, the people that are buy, are buy most bull mostly from South Africa, you can actually do online auctions and participate and even buy a bull. 
the only time you and pay them up front and then you just go and collect your bullet Ramat Labama. Everything is done through this 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 um this V set. You want to do your banking online? You do your banking. You don't actually have to leave the farm. That includes you paying for visa. You don't actually have to leave the farm. I mean, all the banks, everything that you think you can do here. This was really, remember, a dream for people in those remote areas. You want to pay your tax? Once you have registered with BES, you just do it online. You don't actually have to, to do that. Or you want to order any equipment, be it borehole equipment, be it pumps, you actually order all you go and collect, or they give you the like, and they will, you even know whether it's there or not. Or even want to order it in Alibaba, you know, you, you browse. If you remember the farm, there's not many people, you've got a lot of time to browse. And if you are feeling really bored, I mean, you know what, you go to YouTube, you've got all access. If you are a news junkie, once you have uploaded, uploaded some of these apps, whether it's BBC, CNN, Al you can actually watch the news. If you have got a sick employee, you can actually communicate to the people in Letakani, they'll bring them up. These are real things that has happened. They'll actually come and collect the person because we'll tell them exactly where it is. I also had a very a misfortune because one of my guests was once beaten by a snake. And you know, what happened is that got in touch with the hospital in Orapa. We remember you need security because it's an emergency. They will arrange all the security clearance. You take the guy. By the time you go there, you just take him straight to the hospital. And remember, if it's a snake, every minute, every hour counts. So instead of just going there, nobody knows because the, the, the hospital have arranged all the security clearance. Even the nurse was ready. We didn't actually have to wait because of the communication. You know, if you are somebody who does trading, I'm, I mean, I do my trading in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, or you can look at whatever Bloomberg. You actually do it online. You don't actually have to leave. Unfortunately for the BSC, they are not automated. I mean, these are the things that you do without even going through a broker. And you can do it instantly. Whether you are selling shares, whether you are buying shares, wherever. Most of the major stock markets, the New York or the, the London, they're actually there. You can do it online. Once you have actually registered, you've got a, a, an account. I mean, I like reading whether it's farmers' magazines or the economists. Once you have downloaded the apps and you have got internet, it's unlimited. You can actually download and actually read. So, right. And one thing that was unexpected, some of these things are the things you expected. Some of these things are unexpected. You know, when we actually think of the farm, we think of semi-literate or illiterate people, or some of the guys who don't go there. But once they have access to free Wi-Fi, I find it's a great benefit. Some of the guys who used to want to go, they would actually come because they actually want to also to get in touch with their relatives, wherever they are, or with their colleagues from schools, because they can actually, well, mostly they like Facebook, Facebook. I've never seen them Google about bulls, but you know, you will see them hugging there at night, really, <laughs> trying to chat with their friends. It really have to get used to because you'll see people thinking somebody's speaking alone. Apparently, they're talking to somebody elsewhere. You want to keep in touch with family, friends, chat groups. You know, there are lots of chat groups and f um, Facebook groups for whether it's for this specific bull. You do it wherever you are, you know, at wherever they are. You know, I mean, whether it's in te Texas, if you're interested in this top top bulls for months or Brahma, you get in touch with that. And one of the other things that I've, most farmers, we actually complain that our kids don't love the farm. In actual fact, I think they don't like the loneliness. But once they have their gadgets and they go there, they've got time to play with their gadgets. They love their farm. I've got an eight year. He's a 10-year-old boy. I'm, right now, he said, when school's closed, you are going there because he knows that when he comes, he'll just have his um, iPad and connect to wherever I mean, there's some of these games that they like. Or oh, schools are closed due to COVID lockdown. You know, there's this online learning. I mean, the kids can actually do it. I mean, even I, as I'm talking now, I'm registered for a course in, with the ILO in Geneva. I'm actually doing a course there online courses, 
or you want to come here, you know, with the Be Safe, you don't actually have to physically, you just go to the Be Safe application, you apply for a movement permit, instantly you get it. I mean, most farmers, most business people actually we depend on loans. I mean, even seed, I mean, you know, they do have online applications. You just do online application, you'll com communicate with them, they'll help you. And, you know, you want to get assistance from people like Leah, they also help you with online, online application. But you don't actually physically having to go there. I mean, in, in short, what happens is that with this um, kind of visa, even though I installed it some time back, it really helped when it came with this issue of, I think, for you people who work from eight to five, you say work from home, so that you can do most of the thing remotely without leaving the place of residence. I also run a boutique consultancy, you know, um, I mean, in labor law or employee relations. You know, yeah, I keep in touch with my clients. My clients, I'm right, right currently, one of my clients is in, is in Nigeria or Ghana, you know, I'm, they don't know where you are. <laughs> you send the information to them. Or you schedule virtual meetings, whether it's Zoom, WebEx, or Microsoft Teams, you attend those meetings. I've attended meetings with the ILO without ever leaving the farm. Well, the main challenges, there are challenges like everything, you know, some, I think when I look at BTS, I think they're very friendly to urbanites, you know, they give them discounts. My home internet, I find it slow when I wanted to upgrade and I realized that, oh, now this fiber is even 40% discount. Hopefully it will be ex ex extended to the virtual satellites as well. And availability, I found that you know, VSET is rare, it is really rare for it not to be available. You know, and it's no different from home internet. What really happens is that if you have power, because you know, there, I mean, I've got a solar system, it doesn't consume much power. I mean, really, this is, and I think most of the time, if you have a problem, it's also because maybe there's a general network problem. Well, that I can conclude is that with Visa, there's no place that is too remote. Everything is just as close as it is. It has really cut that remoteness. Thank you. Welcome once again. I cannot wait for the time when my kids look forward to going to the farm there, Mr. Valka. I guess I know the right thing to do. Until about a year ago, um, just over 12 months ago, you know, the idea of working from home was somewhat elitist. And uh, it was only the few, the chosen few, who could be allowed to do this mixed piece of work. And uh, COVID has since thrown us into the depth of what we now call the new normal, which is almost everybody having to work from home. We're going to have a conversation with a few uh, panelists here, with a few experts from different organizations to talk about how BTC has actually taken the reins in, in enabling uh, corporates to live and have their workforce uh, under the new normal. So I'm going to let my colleagues here up on stage introduce themselves. I have here Mr. Tumeriso Mpato, and then I also have uh, the good Professor Norris from the University of Botswana. So I'm going to give them each a minute to just introduce themselves uh, so that we are familiar with them. Thank you very much. My name is uh, David Norris. I'm the Vice Chancellor at the University of Botswana. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning. My name is Tumedi Sompato uh, from BTC. I'm a Head of Technology Planning. Thank you. So we're also hoping, just don't be shocked, we're also hoping to have uh, Mr. Taripe could dial in through video link, and if he does, I'll just introduce him and uh, we can proceed with the questions. Uh, so, gentlemen, uh, thank you for <coughs> once again for joining this panel. I think the idea is to just obviously have a conversation around this topic that I just introduced um, in relation to, to remote work. Maybe just to start with you, Prof. Uh, what, um, and I know you touched a little bit on it earlier. Maybe you can just touch on the key points on how the University of Botswana has actually adopted and adapted to the new normal and actually uh, curriculum dissemination through uh, remote means or through digital means. And what steps the university has taken in real terms in actually ensuring that that's a success and there's no gaps in delivery of content. 
Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Let me say that when we were hit by this pandemic, I must concede that we are not really ready for it, just like many other people were. Um, but I think the important thing which I should mention is that uh, as an institution, in our new strategic direction, we're saying we really need to reach out. Access has become very, very important for us. How do we ensure that everybody gets access to university education? And therefore, we are already on a path of introducing what you call blended learning, yes. where we can have face-to-face, -face, but also really enhance our online teaching and learning abilities. So the pandemic came at a time when we were already working on that, mm -hmm. but not at the speed at which the pandemic forced us to, to work. Yeah. So when this thing hit us, we said, we need to move with speed, because otherwise what it would have meant is that we close the institution. And this was going to really disrupt our academic planning. Yeah. So the very first thing that we did, because what it meant was that uh, 15,000 of our students' population would have to get access to learning through online means. Yeah. The very first thing is, do we even have the infrastructure to support that? Yeah. The bandwidth, for instance. I mean, you are going to have everything. You know, you have now to use the Zooms and the Teams and all those things, virtual meetings mm. and all those things. So we approached the BTC. We said, BTC, you need to help us. Because at that time, we only had two gig uh, 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 bandwidth. Yeah. We tripled it to six, and BTC came on board very efficiently, very effectively, okay. and we are really excited yeah. that they could. And to tell the truth, our academic programs have not been disrupted as much as had we not get, got that support. Yeah. We would really have been saying a different story. Great. So I, I, I like that you talk about um, you know, in, inclusivity and uh, providing access to education mm. as, as, as a fundamental right. Mm. Um, just on this point of inclusivity, and I'll come to, to, to Mediso. On, on, on the point of inclusivity, how do you ensure that, you know, given that the access to bandwidth is not, um, you know, affordable in Botswana, mm -hmm. and not least of all in the rest of uh, Sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. What have you done to ensure that there's, there's, you've infused some inclusivity into the way that you put out the curriculum, mm -hmm. particularly in, in, in your remote learning environment? Absolutely. That is one big concern that came to us. We said the very first thing, one, some of our students may not even have those gadgets yeah. that can enable that to receive that type of learning. Correct. Obviously. And then the second thing is, um, financial implications. It means they need data. Mm. That's the other thing that we then approached BTC. Can we give every of our students, every one of our students, some SIM cards loaded with data? Mm -hmm. We approached BTC and we reached an agreement where every one of our students received a BTC SIM card yeah. loaded with one gig of data every day. So this was one way in which we can really uh, uh, make sure that indeed they're able to receive yeah. the teaching and learning through remote means. Mm. The other thing is we went all out because, I mean, in, that is in, it, with respect to those gadgets, the uh, smartphones. We approached the UB Foundation. Mm -hmm. We got some uh, funding from the Motor Center uh, Group, and I think we provided close to 600 mobile devices to those needy students. So that is really how we wow. were able to mitigate against some of these concerns. Wow. Yeah. That uh, really, really deserves a round of applause. Uh, I thought you were saying we then approached BTC for some money. <laughs> and they gave the students some money. But uh, Mr. Mr. Mpato, if I, if I just may, the, what did you do without getting too technical to enable what uh, the prof was just speaking to? from a technical perspective, infrastructurally, what are the steps you had to take to make sure that you, you, you can provide bandwidth to the students in need, the students that need to, to, to receive the e-learning the e as it were? Uh, thank you for the question. 
uh, since uh, the pandemic, and we could also see in other countries there were lockdowns, yep. and we knew it was inevitable. It was coming to our country, so we had to plan ahead in advance, <coughs> and we had to think about the impact that it can have on the education sector, on other businesses. Yeah. So we looked at our infrastructure. Our network was somehow ready to accommodate the future demands. As we had prof, they used to have uh, two gig, but they wanted to triple it. Mm -hmm. But what we have done, we knew that we don't have control cross border. Because as you can see, we're a landlord country. Yeah. For us to uh, reach the internet under sea cables, we have to transit through uh, the neighboring countries. So what we have done, we try to localize content as much as we can do. And then we also upgraded our network. Mm -hmm. And because we were dealing with students, obviously they cannot afford to have like a fixed broadband and they cannot afford to be confined mm -hmm. to a specific uh, locality or house. So we had to look at our mobile. Thanks to the uh, investment that we made in advance, the 4G network, it was ready to accommodate uh, the, those particular demands. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then, Prof, just back to you on the, 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 the issue of e-learning. I'm not sure how ready you were from a software and from a platform perspective to actually transition and, and go into the e-learning mode of teaching. No, I would say that uh, our internet infrastructure at UB yeah. is actually sound. I think one of the biggest challenges that we had was only on the, the server storage capacity and so forth. But really, I don't think it was not a bad transition. It yep. was, yes, I wouldn't say it was seamless, yep. but there were all those challenges. But I want to say that the transition really was relatively or generally yeah. quite smooth. OK. Okay. Yeah. So there was some investment in yes. e e-learning e platforms. Absolutely. And actually, we are continuing even now, yeah, because we are looking would. into the future. Yep. We are putting about uh, 50 million in the next two years yes. just to upgrade our, our infrastructure, our platforms. OK. Yes. And then uh, just outside of the, the education, Mr. Mpato, what other industries would you say benefited from uh, your platforms and your infrastructure upgrades to, 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 to you know, partner with organizations around remote work? Yeah. And how would you say they benefited? I would say uh, almost all the citizens yeah. who extended this uh, uh, connectivity to almost every Montana in the whole country. We have enterprise customers who also had to make sure that business continuity is not compromised. Mm -hmm. And obviously with the lockdowns, they had to work with skeletal uh, staff at the office. And then the rest of the staff should work from home. Yeah. So we rolled out uh, fiber to the home uh, with connectivity uh, for more than 8,000 uh, plots within Haboroni. Right. And then we also took advantage of Bofinet rollout plan as well. So we worked with our enterprise customers and understand their needs in the market, how we can enable them to continue the business right. and use our digital platform to enable them to interact uh, virtually. Okay. Yes. And um, what were the challenges that you faced in, in that rollout, as it were? The demand. Okay. Yeah, we received lots of uh, orders within a short period of time, and they, we had to make sure that they are connected within a short period of time. The time to market for the products that we launched, we have to make sure that we deliver within a short period of time, something that we never did before. Yeah. And of course, the demand shifted from the business area, from the industrial area, to the residential area. Mm -hmm. And thanks to our FTTH and our 4.5G, that is how we managed to keep up with the demand on the connectivity side. OK. Yes. okay. Um, I think just back to the audience to say that uh, we, we do have our comments and questions box open on the website. Please feel free to, th to throw in your questions and bring them over. If there's any, they'll be brought to me over here and then I can ask the panel the same questions. Uh, just back to you, Mr. Mpato, I just wanted to understand um, how you assisted organizations in migrating to the home and ensuring that there's some cybersecurity considerations that are taken into place. Uh, is that a capability that you have within the organization and how do you met that out? We do have the capability 
uh, as you have uh, heard the previous speakers, when we introduced our data center, it was really there to help our customers okay. to be able to conduct business, uh, be it online, be it remote from home. Mm -hmm. And we knew that security has to be viewed as paramount consideration. Yeah. So we have products like uh, Security as a Service, and we have partnered with the likes of Microsoft, uh, Fortinet, and other key uh, pa partners, or we formed key partnerships, mm. so that we make sure that as much as we give you uh, the internet, we also understand that it has to be secure. So when you okay. connect from home, it has to be through a secure uh, connection end to end, so that your data is protected. Okay, so some, some industries like mining, um, and I'm not excluding you, Prof. Uh, I, I seem to be just talking to... Some industries like, uh, like mining, like logistics, uh, supply chain, etc., tend to go for platforms such as the Internet of Things. What um, solutions do you have in that space to enable those sort of environments for smart devices, etc.? We, 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 I, I would not say we have done uh, uh, something that is really there to meet uh, their demands. Mm. But what we do, we know that we cannot deliver each and every uh, particular product alone as BTC. Yeah. We have formed partnerships with the key partners that are able to understand the mining needs. Okay. So normally we engage the customer, understand their requirements, and see how we can meet that particular demand without compromising uh, be it the experience or the security aspect. Okay, and then, and then in terms of upgrading, is it safe to say that you also, much like the university had to, also had to you know, expend some investment in upgrading your infrastructure to ensure that you can take the load that was coming with all of this, these changes that we just spoke to? That was inevitable. Yeah. It had to be done. Yeah. And I also want to thank the regulator because on the mobile network, what we've experienced is that since a lockdown, right. the traffic increased by more than 260%. And so did the revenue. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, we, we had to yeah. uh, 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 seek assistance from the regulator because the perspective that we had by then yeah. it was not really sufficient to keep up with the demand from yeah. the customer side. So they gave us a temporary spectrum yeah. that you could use on the LTE network and also on what you call point to multi point for customers that are connecting right. from home. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm going to throw this question to you, you both gentlemen, just to, to get your sense, your two minute sense in summary of uh, how you think, whether, whether or not you do believe that the, the remote working experience or remote uh, learning experience in your case is sustainable. What's, what's your view on the sustainability of this, this new uh, structure? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> from the education perspective, you know there are some degree programs that require experiential learning, yep. practical learning, where you really cannot do it remotely. Yep. So that is why for us, really, we still would go for blended kind of learning. Uh, that is if the yeah. opportunity allows, if the pandemic goes away. Because you still need our students in labs where they do practicals, practical skills. Yeah. I mean, if you think of engineering students, if you think of medical students, it's hands-on. And therefore, it can never be entirely remote. Yeah. So it's not sustainable in that sense. That remember, the critical thing is instill vocational skills, right. practical skills, yeah. and that cannot be done remotely. remotely. Yes. So how are you currently plugging that gap? Uh, that's an issue because remember, there's still the restrictions uh, from the first lockdown. Yes. It was total, basically total blackout, if I may say it, yeah. for two weeks. Yeah. But then, because the restrictions have been restricted, we still had to head to the spacing, mm -hmm. you know, distancing, and even we reconfigured our labs so that they are no longer close to each other and yes, so forth. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Bata? Uh, thanks for the question. Actually, in uh, every difficulty, there's an opportunity. Mm. Uh, I'm one of those people who took advantage of working from home. And actually, uh, in our company, we started it before it was mandated. 
Yeah. I've been working from home uh, since last year, April, mm -hmm. and I've realized that it does increase productivity. Uh, it depends on how you conduct your work. So we also uh, use it as a platform now to move with the digital transformation. Yeah. Because the businesses, as you have uh, know, realized, is that there are more businesses that are now uh, doing business online. Right, yeah. right. The convenience, when you talk about uh, customer centricity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, customer experience, uh, personalization of products and uh, stuff like that. Mm. So this uh, pandemic somehow brought an opportunity for us to leverage on the technologies or digital platforms that are there mm. to enhance the productivity and the experience. So I believe even post lockdowns, there'll be uh, certain businesses who are still uh, doing uh, work from home and continue with the e-commerce, the e-learning, where students are not confined in uh, classrooms. They can have access to the content at any particular point in time and even choose uh, the teacher of their own choice. Right, yes. right. So that's okay. how I see it. Um, as, as you were talking now, I just, I just thought about something, and maybe I'm going to put you on the spot, which is to say, as, as we see the ramping up of things like fiber to the home, connectivity to the house, you know, more reliable connectivity to the home. Are we seeing a doubling down on uh, the connectivity that would, pro would traditionally have been to the enterprise office, which therefore balances out the, the adoption as it were? Actually, it's very interesting. That's what we thought would happen. We thought internet would move towards to the home. To the home. But that was not the case. Even on the enterprise side, we still see a lot of traffic coming from there at the same time to the home. And the overall, since the lockdown, the overall traffic increased by 78% through our network. Okay. So that means that more Botswana are getting uh, connections that are now connected and they still demand more speeds. Yeah. As you can, uh, if you recall, we used to offer up to four meg, yeah. but right now we can even offer you up to 100 meg uh, towards your home. Yeah. And he said they upgraded the internet from two gig to six gig. Okay. You see, so even at the business enterprises, they demand even higher capacities. So overall, the, the, the overall quantum is upwards? Yes. It's positive, okay. Yes. That's great. Um, I think there is a couple of questions that I uh, was hoping will come through. Uh, so this one is to you, Professor Norris. Uh, do we see the UB moving its classes to 100% online for a four-year course and graduate without even coming to Khabarone? I think you touched a little bit on it, but I'll allow you to maybe expand a little on that. Yes, you indeed. You on the challenges. But. Yes, indeed, it's possible. Um, this very morning, for instance, I was just checking, comparing ourselves, the, the Wi-Fi uh, speech, for instance. Yeah. I was comparing us, ourselves with universities in the U.S. Uh, Harvard University, for instance, on average, is about 37.16. Yale, 124. And we range between 60 and 100 at the University of Arizona. Very comparable. Okay. To, 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 to universities in the U.S. Yes. So this was pleasing to us. From our office, the download speed was at 939, and the upload speed, 212. That is massive. Mm. That is yeah. really massive. Yeah. So this is possible. This is really possible. I see it as possible. And like I was saying, one of the things that we were just discussing yesterday with the finance man was how do we even improve it further? Mm. Because what we are saying is we can even reduce, we, we may not even give students the SIM cards, those, are, those, are th those that are resident on campus. But if yep. our Wi-Fi connectivity is excellent on campus, then we can save okay. on the SIM cards for those who are, because they can access it anyway. Okay. Yes. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, just, just while we wait for the other question, I think the... With obviously issuing out a lot more SIM cards, and I, I take the point that you would have upgraded the infrastructure to make sure that it's commensurate with uh, the subscriber base. But you know these things happen, and sometimes the load is, you know, outweighs the the demand. So this question, I'd hope that uh, Mr. Pick would be here, but I think it, it's really to say, uh, in your engagements with with uh, people like Bokra. Has there been conversations around upgrading the spectrums just to ensure that we can, we can kind of increase the pipes and, and have people access the internet quicker? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, 
there's been uh, those kind of conversations. And like I said earlier, they even gave us temporary spectrum to enable us to upgrade the infrastructure yeah. Yeah. so that we can meet this ever-growing demand. And we are now thinking 5G because yeah. what we see is that even when we are given the temporary spectrum to upgrade on the 4G, the traffic is growing at an exponential rate. Yeah. So we have to think uh, long term now. Yeah. yeah. So 5G is the future and we are getting ready for that. Um, so actually just on 5G, because I, I know there's a lot of talk around it, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, uh, Mr. Masunga earlier spoke about the 4.5G that uh, uh, BTC puts out. The adoption of 5G in, in your knowledge, is, is it going to involve a complete overhaul of the existing infrastructure or is it an augmentation of what you already have from an investment point of view? It will be an augmentation. Yeah. As our MD said, we are now at 4.5G, mm. which means we are closer to 5G. So it's not going to be a total uh, overhaul. Right. Yes, yeah, so we'll be building on the existing infrastructure because when we did uh, our investment on our 4G, we had 5G in mind. We wanted an infrastructure that is basically 5G ready. Yes, and yes. I can say we are very close. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, I, I do believe there's one more question. Um, this is to Mr. Mopako. Uh, what is BTC's broadband strategy in the next five years with these fast-paced technology trends? Um, I wish I could project because yeah. I had it on my slides. But if I were to just take it back a little bit, we started with copper. We used to deliver our broadband uh, through copper. Yeah. And then it has its own limitations and it's also prone to theft. Yeah. As you have seen, uh, we've been on TV several times. And we are now moving away from the legacy technology such as copper towards fiber. I did hear earlier yeah. that you fork forklifted it out. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then our connection towards home, we are moving yeah. away from copper towards fiber. Right. And also on the mobility, we are now from 5.5G, 5.5G, we are thinking 5G. So we'll be doing fiber and 5G okay. in the near future. Yeah. And of course, VSET is there to uh, reach out to each and every Motswana at any yeah. uh, location so that even the farmers, they should be able to uh, do business online yeah. and take care of uh, the farming things uh, in remote areas. So okay. we also have what you call air fiber, whereby if you are uh, within a 40 or 60 kilometer radius, we are able to deliver uh, up to 500 Mbps towards your farm or uh, your lodge. Beautiful. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That is the strategy. So that we should be able to deliver at least 100 Mbps mm. to uh, every Motswana. That is encouraging. Yes. Uh, just one last question I believe we have. How is, how is BTC doing this to strategize on and enhance skills of the local people in terms of digital approach with regards to farming in general? I'm not sure if that makes sense. How is BTC doing to strategize and enhance skills of the local people in terms of digital approach with regards to farming in general? Yeah, I, I hope I understand the question. But basically, obviously, you need to uh, raise awareness. Yeah. There has to be a buy-in internally, the employees, and also the community yeah. at large. So if you don't have buy-in from the people, that can also be a roadblock or a dead yeah. end. So we are continuing engaging uh, internal staff and encouraging them to yeah. uh, move with uh, the uh, transformation yeah. or it's like the digital shift. And also customers who have uh, continuous engagement to uh, somehow demonstrate the benefits of adopting uh, the technologies that are out there. And then now talking about the farmers, there are so many uh, tools that they can use to enhance their productivity. Right. You talked about IoT. You can use your machines to machine to uh, make sure that you improve uh, your quality or, and also the productivity. So we'll continue the engagement with uh, our customers and the farmers uh, also uh, included in, in those engagements. Makes sense. Yes. Okay, so I think we, we're going we're gonna to close it here. Uh, I'm just going to give each of you one minute to, to talk about, you see, as, as public institutions, obviously you have a responsibility to, uh, quote unquote, give back. And, and foster innovation, but uh, you know, um, uh, case in point being the conversations of today, how as institutions are you, are you participating in, in innovation-centric partnerships? And I'll start with you, Prof, if you don't mind. 
Thank you very much. Let me just say that as an organization, as an institution of higher learning, yeah. one of the fundamental things for us is relevance to society. And we can only become relevant when we are also a high performance organization. And in our strategic objectives, we are saying this high performance will really be brought through mm. by utilization of high tech digital resources. This is where we want to go. Right. So that really we can bring this innovation and be really in the driving seat when you talk about innovation in this country. I'm with you. Mr. Um, Park. BTC, we believe in partnerships. We believe yeah. in uh, empowering the citizens. And we, we have the talent. We have a program that is known as uh, InnoPort, where we, we encourage innovation. And we also bring uh, the uh, young Botswana from outside to come and uh, partner with us. Because if you look at what the digital shift have done, it's like the big companies, those who refuse to uh, embrace the right. new uh, innovations, uh, most of them are out of business. I can yeah. give you a simple example. When you think Blockbuster, mm. they refused yeah. to partner with Netflix yeah. because they thought they were too big for Netflix. Disruption. And where are they yeah. right now? That's what can happen to you if you think you are too big to embrace uh, the <laughs> innovation. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Not true. Thank you. Thanks a lot, gentlemen, for your engagement in this conversation. It was very informative. Um, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Giselle, who will take us forward in the program. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Cheers. Remo Paco, Professor Norris, and my favorite new male MC, Ohone. Thank you so very much for such an engaging panel discussion. So if you haven't yet joined the 16 or over 16,000 followers that BTC has on Twitter, please do go ahead and do the right thing. And as you explore this digital summit, do feel free to share your sentiments and highlights from this first interactive session of ours, which shifted us into the topic remote work, how has been BTC enabled the new normal. Well, thanks a lot for staying with us as we continue with Digital Shift BW experience powered by BTC. Now we shift into the technology positioning of 5G. So for a more reactive and more enabling connection and a chance at real innovation through artificial intelligence and various other technological advancements meant to activate out-of-the-box creation and developments, 5G is currently the most suitable facilitator. But don't take my word for it. A man you can quote on this is up next. Please join me in standing by for Mr. Nimrod Smith from Huawei's Southern African Career, Career Marketing Office. Thanks again to Mr. Nimrod Smith from Huawei. G. For a more reactive and more enabling connection and a chance at real innovation through artificial intelligence, machine learning and more of the technological advancements meant to further creation and development, 5G is currently the most suitable. Honorable guests, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in the Shift Digital Conference, Botswana, hosted by BTC. My name is Nimrod Smith, representing Huawei, but more specifically, Southern Africa Career Marketing Department. I have 26 years experience in the ITC sector, with a focus on technology strategy, and also did end-to-end -end network planning. Welcome to the Shift 5G presentation. Today I want to share the following with you. Of course, virtually because of the pandemic. So today, uh, if we look at the context, I'll talk a bit about a better world. Then we'll explore 5G and give a global update. Um, I'll also look at some 5G use cases for the 2C, 2B and 2H. And of course, these are the consumer uh, business and uh, to the home type of uh, use cases. Then uh, finally we'll also look at some 5G uh, network deployments across Africa and then finally we'll also have a look into the future with 5G. 
But first, I think it's important to answer the question why. Why are we deploying these technologies across the world? And of course, it's to make our world a better place. So please join me in viewing the following video. The digital network is a forest full of wonders. From sprouting seeds to deep-rooted leafy trees. All beacons transmitting the frequencies of life. Signals of intelligence are spread. Each new connection creating limitless possibilities. 5G brings us to new heights. Presents us with distant views. Turns our wildest dreams into reality. shows us how wonderful life can be. The future starts where change begins. And change begins now. space to keep us healthy. Realizes the dream of making education accessible everywhere. Accelerates intelligence to make manufacturing secure and efficient. 5G connectivity benefits countless households, allows industries to flourish in a shared ecosystem, innovates to create a digitelligent forest in a vibrant ecosystem with a solid foundation. Yes, I think definitely we're living in exciting times. I think you would agree. So if we just quickly look at um, 5G, how it is maturing across uh, the globe, and we look firstly at the uh, 5G ecosystem, we can clearly see that it's basically booming uh, with around 822 plus uh, uh, announced 5G devices. We further have about 62 of these uh, devices are actually commercially available, which is around 511 devices. So if we look at 5G smartphones, there's around 365 plus uh, announced 5G smartphones and uh, another 190 plus CPE devices. Then if we quickly just look at um, the pricing, the pricing of the devices actually came down, which is actually quite a good thing. And now you can actually obtain a budget 5G smartphone for around 100 US dollars. And if you're in the market for a CPE or is a CPE to the home or to the business type application, you can actually acquire a CPE for around 120 US dollars, which I think is, is quite affordable at this stage. But the prices, I think, will come down further as the market further mature. Then if we just look at the first uh, two years, uh, the, the, the size of these deployments, we can see that there is about 169 5G commercial networks uh, across the globe and uh, that covers about 70 countries or territories. Further to that we see about 800 million 5G subscribers which I think is quite significant in about two years time and then also um, there's about 70 percent of the phones which are basically shipped um, worldwide is actually 5G capable and in uh, China this figure is actually higher at around 80% of the phones that shipped to China is actually 5G capable. Then if we just look at the network deployments, uh, around a million sites is actually active at the moment, million plus, which I think is quite a large deployment uh, considering the time. And as per the statement at the bottom of the slide, yes, um, the deployment of 5G is around three times faster than what we've seen 
for 4G networks. So, as mentioned earlier, 5G is changing our lives, but also how we work. So, if we look at two, let's call it more high-level use cases, one is for personal communications and the other is more related to the industrial uh, industry or the digitali digitalization of the industry. But first, if we just consider personal communications uh, regarding user experience, etc., uh, you can quickly see that a lot of the new 5G phones that is actually shipped 60% um, of those are actually equipped with a 2K uh, display, which uh, increase, of course, the user experience or improve it. So if we just look at HD video, um, the, the number of uh, full HD 1080p videos um, uh, as people consume it is actually uh, growing. So from the past, around 42% of people enjoying full HD content 1080p and uh, currently now with the 5G technologies, people are using up to 70% of the content is consumed in full HD. Then another uh, good development, of course, is also the immersive AR VR experience. And um, here we've seen in Southern Korea, we've seen uh, quite a substantial increase of around 30% plus uh, in the number of AR VR users. And then also um, the, the number of device shipments of AR VR uh, devices have increased with about 35%. Then if we just uh, look at industries uh, regarding IoT and the industry digitalization, um, 20 plus industries that has adopted um, you know, 5G with IoT, etc. And uh, there's lots of innovative projects, around 5,000 of these, and then uh, even more commercial uh, contracts being assigned. Uh, these type of um, digitalization projects are typically in the mining, in the iron and steel industry, smart ports, and of course, a smart manufacturer. Uh, then I think we, uh, everybody knows that uh, basically uh, South Korea was one of the first countries to, to launch a 5G and then uh, followed by uh, China. But if we just quickly um, focus on South Korea, we can clearly see um, that their network uh, deployment, original deployment in Q1 of 2019, um, they focus on seven of their big metros uh, and um, basically about 50,000 subscribers uh, joined the 5G network. Then shortly after that, about 12 months later, that grew to about 85 of the main cities and there we just have underneath 200,000 uh, subscribers joining the 5G network. So uh, by the end of this year, it's envisaged that around 570 uh, 5G users will be active on the network and of course uh, the coverage will now include also rural areas. Then if we just focus on the traffic, you can clearly see that uh, from around November last year in 2020, um, they've reached a milestone of around 20% uh, population coverage, but already at that stage the 5G uh, traffic was around 40% of total, which is also significant. Then quickly, um, just uh, f focusing on some of the AR, VR um, use cases in uh, South Korea, we can clearly see that um, there's a significant growth. And this is LG U+, um, a network in South Korea. And they've uh, noted that um, from the um, marketing drive, the, uh, the number of actually contents um, and apps has increased significantly from around 600 VR apps to over 2,500 apps and contents. Then um, uh, regarding ARPU, we can also see that um, there's an ARPU uplift uh, because people are uh, you know, consuming this content, um, the high definition videos, but also AR, VR content, and people are willing to pay for these uh, services. So the ARPU on, on 4G of around uh, 36 US dollars increased uh, with 37% to around 50 US dollars uh, ARPU. Then, uh, just regarding the wireless revenue, also uh, since uh, launching 5G, the revenues have increased with around 6.5% to around 6.88 billion US dollars for 2020. Then um, I think you'll all note that uh, fixed wireless access is one of the uh, bigger use cases. Uh, this is, um, you know, to, to home, uh, it's also to um, business, but also consumer. So um, fixed wireless access is seen as a significant dri driving factor for 5G. And as per the statistics, you can clearly see that around 488 operators have launched uh, fixed wireless access um, 
uh, subscriptions or networks and here we have around 436 4G networks um, uh, that has deployed fixed wireless access and around 63 5G networks related to fixed wireless access. And then if you just look at the number of uh, CPE vendors, those also have increased significantly and there's now around 80 plus uh, 5G CPE vendors. And of course, as also per the graph, um, the pricing for the CPEs are coming down. So from around 300 US dollars in 2019 to uh, currently at sitting around 120 US dollars for a CPE unit. Then if we just look at typical scenarios for deploying uh, this fixed wireless access type of services, um, we can clearly see that uh, TIM 5G uh, deployed their fixed wireless access uh, to complement their fixed uh, uh, broadband service um, where you can basically fall back onto uh, 5G or if there's no fiber uh, in your area you can basically use uh, fixed wireless access on 5G. Then if we just look at Zane, Zane is basically uh, offering it as an alternative to, to, to fiber. Um, so you can basically either have fiber to your home or you can have uh, 5G uh, fixed wireless access. So there's uh, the uh, opportunity for choice. Then uh, Vodafone has actually taken an approach to assist people with this type of, let's call it nomadic um, scenarios, where you basically want 5G uh, wherever you go and you just take your CPE with you. So now if we focus a bit uh, to business type of uh, use cases, uh, special focus more on the, the mining uh, sector, because we know in Botswana there is, um, you know, the mining activities uh, is quite significant uh, in both in shaft and open pit type mining. And here is where 5G uh, can actually play quite a part. But uh, carriers must also embrace that uh, it's no longer just about providing uh, 5G connectivity or connectivity, but they have to enhance this connectivity with also being a cloud provider. And then finally also some processing or artificial intelligence. So it will be about providing uh, connectivity. It will also uh, be about providing cloud services or cloud related services together with some intelligence and computing to make sure that it's an end to end type of solution. So what we're actually seeing in the mining is the, the digitalization of mining, that manual uh, duties is now replaced by automation or what we also call uh, unattended type of activities where this is done by artificial intelligence and the automation of certain processes. And then next, uh, if we also consider um, the total mining area where the actual labor is done, that because of automation and this improved digitalization, we see that um, the number of miners requiring to do the actual tasks also reduce. But a lot of these miners can then be you know, uh, further upskilled to be used in more uh, higher level activities in the mine. Then finally, um, we also see that uh, typical type of inspection on conveyor belts that was previously manually inspected can now also be automated and it's actually intelligently um, being uh, inspected for, for pro possible problems or defects. Then if we just focus quickly on, on the right hand side on the scenario based solution of innovation, you can clearly see that at the bottom you have the connectivity um, of the basic network, you have your uh, computing, your cloud capabilities and then of course your intelligence and that will then form also a holistic approach towards having end to end type of applications. What is also quite important to state is because a lot of you will say, oh, but you know what, we can actually deploy uh, Wi-Fi in certain areas. It's not always the ideal uh, solution to deploy uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, 5G is a lot more stable. Um, and of course, it's also related to a improved uplink. You actually need a, a lot more uh, uplink uh, capability or throughput to make sure that you can basically monitor these activities and also create enough data to, to, to process um, this data uh, in the cloud and to react on, on the data in real time. So that's why you need quite a, a, a stable and a large capacity uplink to ensure that you can capture these uh, activities. 
Then let's just quickly look at the Africa footprint related to 5G deployments. We can see good progress have been made. So uh, typically there's been eight commercial networks already launched and that is cr across six countries. And of note, we can clearly see in South Africa, there's already three operators that launched the 5G services and it's related to fixed wireless access. So then if we consider Safaricom, they've also launched um, quite recently and uh, they are progressing actually very well. And currently they are the number one supplier of fixed wireless access in Kenya. Then um, some others to note as well, Seychelles has also launched uh, 5G services in July of 2020 and then further to that also uh, we see a 5G network in Madagascar. Then if we just look at uh, the number of connections, you can clearly see that the connections have grown and currently we're sitting at around 600,000 um, uh, connections in Sub-Saharan Africa, which I think is quite uh, significant. And then uh, it is projected that we'll sit around 33 million uh, subscribers by 2025. This is now 5G subscribers or 5G connections. Then uh, related to, to device shipments, we can also see um, that there is a significant upturn in 5G devices and in Q1 of 2021 we are sitting at around 144,000 devices that have been shipped. This is now of course 5G devices and this makes out about 1.5% of all devices that have been shipped. Then last but not least, I think it's very important to um, also uh, ensure that you get the correct uh, spectrum when you deploy 5G or have access to the right spectrum. And here, we, of course, we're talking about the C-band. And if we look at the uh, diagram on the left-hand side, we can clearly see that 3.5 is the preferred uh, spectrum band. And um, although there is some deployments on 2.1 and 1.8 gigahertz, you can clearly see um, that the C-band is the preferred uh, spectrum. And which operators have launched with is the, the C-band. Then if we uh, take our attention to the right hand side, the top right hand side, we can also see that um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, networks have actually been deployed with 3.5 gigahertz, which is again uh, the C band. And then just lastly, if we quickly glance to the, the right bottom side, uh, if we glance to the right bottom graph, we can also see that um, highlighted in red, uh, all the major carriers has basically received around 80 megahertz or more of spectrum um, to, to, to deploy their networks or to build uh, their customer base. And um, also again, we just want to highlight that it's very important that, that you, you basically assign a, a minimum of about 100 megahertz to really have the benefits of a true 5G network. Yeah, so finally I just want to share a video with you guys and this is a look towards the future. Of course this future is with 5G and I think you guys will agree with me this is really uh, some exciting times that's uh, laying ahead for us, for us all. What is a better world? It's a new answer to an old question. It's a fantasy or wish being realized. It's innovation and transcendence. Repetitive inefficient work will be replaced by lean production. Dangers will be forecast, making safety the norm. Distance will no longer limit our vision, enabling more vivid and diverse education. Medical services will be available at home, providing better care to all. In a better world, connections do not exist only between people, but also between vehicles, machines, and buildings. A new digital ecosystem will emerge in the cloud. Computing is at our fingertips. Facilities can independently think, learn, and solve problems. Intelligence will enter all industries and reach every corner of the globe. What you are familiar with will be refreshed. What you take for granted will be improved. Innovation is the result of connection, 
and transcendence is enabled by intelligence. The equation for a better world has been written. In the past, we contributed to the best of our ability. In the future, we will gather all there is and grow through connections. Thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity for me to be able to present at the Digital Shift uh, Botswana conference. Thank you and goodbye. Hi, my name is Boigi Pitlo. I'm a product developer at BTC. Today, I'm going to explain to you about the product called VSET. VSET stands for Very Small Aperture Terminal. This is a satellite internet that allows you to attain the service of internet in the comfort of your home or your business, anywhere in the, in the country. VSET speaks to a customer that could be in an area where there is no or minimal infrastructure. An example could be, you could have a farm at the Sandveld, or you can have a, a lodge at Lokobango Swamp. We all know that these are natural habitats that there is minimal to no infrastructure, like your roads, your telephone line, or your power. And with that, internet services can actually reach you anywhere in these areas. And therefore, BTC can allow us, can, BTC can actually um, give you services in those areas. How do you go about it? Is that uh, you can get speeds of up to 512, kbps that's kilobits per second all the way to 50 megabits per second you can get internet services you can do anything with regards to your netflixes your showmax your email whatsapp anything that you you wish for and therefore as i as, as, as i've already mentioned the only requirement that is there would be to would be power to power up that modem that gets installed in your on your business or your home but remember, even power nowadays, you can actually get it through solar. So even if you don't have a grid, you will still be able to power up your, your internet and be able to use it. The market segments that we have VSET um, speaking to are your government, your corporates, your small, medium enterprises, and your home. In your home, that's me and you. It could be your farm, it could be your house, and therefore you'll be able to attain that service in that manner. If you want to attain VSET, you can get it from our website, that's www.btc.bw, and you will find our online application. You'll fill up the form and you submit it. There'll be some requirements that you need to upload, and that'll, that, that application will reach us, and therefore we'll be able to, to, to carry out your, your, your application. You can also call us at 3958-000, or you can email us at sales at btc.bw. BTC. Live Connected. Nimrod Smith from Huawei, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, so that brings us to the end of the segment on 5G. I think uh, it suffice to say that you would have learned that 5G is not only about fast, fast, fast speeds of connectivity, but it's really about improving our lives and improving the way and changing the way that we, we live from day to day, the way that we interact with the world around us, um, either through applications or through other innovations that will be enabled through this technology. It, it also dovetails quite nicely into our next segment, which is the cloud computing, which uh, we'll start in a second, and you want to maybe introduce who's coming next? Erra, I'll certainly give it a shot. Up next, to take us through the conversation about cloud and to take us through BTC's technology positioning. Up next is the head of IT infrastructure, Mr. Tsepo Mungalo. <laughs> Cloud, 
With cloud, we can all have a secure digital platform that is conducive for remote work and creative collaboration. And ease of access to resources empowering all businesses to grow further than only their communities. Morning, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good time. Um, it's been an, a, a packed morning so far, and um, I think you, I believe you have um, learned a lot from from the presentations today. Um, I'll be taking you through um, Shift Cloud, and um, the, the the presentation is going to. Um, I'm going to take you through the the data center journey for BTC. I'm going to take um, you into 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 our cloud services, and then um, you know our cloud partnerships, the security in the cloud, as well as data sovereignty. Um, I, I think I'll, just before I start, I just want to have a quick reflection on, on, on COVID-19. Um, I think, ladies and gentlemen, everybody knows we are under siege and we've had a, a recent upsurge in infections, and it's incumbent upon all of us to heed health protocols and stay safe. Um, the pandemic is doing its best to divide us, but thanks to technology, and in particular, cloud-based virtualization, oh, sorry, cloud-based um, uh, and virtual collaboration platforms such as your Microsoft Teams, we are able to be together at this summit um, today. Um, BTC runs the, the multi-tenant Central Data Center, which plays host to, to amongst others, the BTC Cloud, um, the BTC Mobile Network Infrastructure, as well as the, 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 the locally um, developed e-learning platform, Classmate. Um, the data center is an enabler for both BTC and for our, our digital um, transformation initiatives, including that, those of our customers, because we exist to, 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 to enable our customers as well. Um, it offers tailor-made solutions for enterprise and SME market segments. The data center also hosts um, global content providers and content delivery networks, CDNs, to allow caching and localization of content, thereby improving customer experience, as well as cutting um, costs by reducing international internet traffic. Thanks to the multi-tenant um, nature of our data center, we are also able to host local entities across different um, industry verticals. Um, you must also note that um, BTC, we treat BTC as a tenant inside our data center. Um, also, uh, as part of our cloud strategy, um, BTC is in partnership um, with, with global cloud service providers to bring products and services in country as an edge location and also as a reseller. We also continue to explore partnerships with other hyperscalers as well as um, local entities to, in, to enhance our product portfolio and to, to, to um, enable our customers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the data center is the foundation and engine for the modern enterprise. It is therefore imperative that uh, mission critical data centers are well thought out, designed, constructed, maintained, and operat operated in alignment with the required high industry standards. The BTC Central Data Center is the first and only Uptime Institute tier certified data center in the country in Botswana, meaning that um, the data center meets very, very stringent design and construction standards as evidenced by the tier certification for constructed facility, the TCCF um, for, uh, certification that we are so proud of. Um, BTC chose to have our, 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 our data center certified by Uptime Institute, um, which is the most authoritative certification body since our business and that of our very, very valuable customers, depends on it. Um, Uptime Institute is the industry's most trusted and adopted global standard for proper design, build, and operation of data centers, the backbone of a digital economy. 
Achieving tier rating um, also signals to investors, customers, as well as the marketplace that our facility meets the highest standards of infrastructure functionality and quality. It validates that the design, the facility design and construction is consistent with BTC's uptime objectives. Tier certification also means that deficiencies in the design are identified, resolved, and tested before commencement of operations. The data center is the bedrock of BTC's cloud services, which bring world-class technologies where customers need them most. BTC provides on-demand, enterprise-grade compute, networking, storage, designed to handle different types, different kinds of workloads. Um, traditionally, companies build IT server rooms and recruit IT officers who are tasked with the responsibility of maintaining um, the company's IT environment. However, the cost of maintaining IT environments has been skyrocketing due to, amongst others, huge capex outlays to build server rooms and procure IT infrastructure, maintenance costs for the facilities as well as the systems, electricity consumption by the infrastructure for powering and cooling the equipment, the need to ensure sufficient power backup to guard against um, power outages, which have been prevalent in, in, in recent memory. Um, there's also, um, we're also looking at the, the need for, for, for increased service availability for business continuity as well. Um, technology changes are also um, influencing um, the, 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 this as well because um, organizations have, are forced to um, keep doing technology refreshes at huge costs. The need to simplify IT for easy adoption and integration as well as the, 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 the need to automate business processes have further put pressure on companies to relook at their IT investments to optimize and make, maximize IT asset utilization. Um, there are different cloud deployment models, and depending on an organization's cloud strategy, different models can be adopted. Um, this requires in-depth assessment, and it is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, with the on-premises model, private clouds are reserved for use by an organization. Um, On-premise offers the same type of elastic um, virtualized services as public clouds. Difference being that um, because it's on-premises, you have more control and you have um, you know, more visibility into lower level infrastructure. With a cloud-based model, all applications are migrated to the cloud. Design and build of new applications is all done in the cloud. In this case, there is no need for on-site hardware or any capital expenditure because everything is on the cloud. It is a model that is easily scalable and resources are often availed on demand so, that, um, so you only pay for what you use. The hybrid deployment model, on the other hand, is a combination of the two. Um, Cloud-based resources are connected to on-prem infrastructure, which allows for integration with legacy IT applications. Um, traditionally, like I said, on-prem is where an organization manages the whole stack from you know, facilities all the way to networking, storage, um, up to, 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 to applications. Um, with infrastructure as a service, um, this kind of service model, the, 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 the facilities, networking, storage, servers and virtualization are outsourced to a cloud service provider. And then the customer is um, responsible for managing the rest of the, the, rest of the stack. Um, all the way up to software as a service. Um, with software as a service, um, the cloud services provider manages everything, meaning the customer outsources the whole stack. Exa example being your Office 365. Um, under, under cloud security and, and data sovereignty, I'll start with the, data, with the cloud security for now. Um, here, we use a shared responsibility model, which is a, a cloud security framework that dictates the security obligations of a cloud services provider and that of the user to ensure accountability. In this model, security ownership must be clearly defined, with each party maintaining complete control of the assets, processes, and functions that they own. BTC 
as a cloud services provider is responsible for security of the cloud, which means that BTC has to ensure protection of underlying infrastructure that runs on that runs all the services offered by the, offered in the BTC cloud. This infrastructure is composed of the facilities, which means BTC has to ensure both physical and logical security of such. And um, it also covers networking, your perimeter security, the hardware and the firmware that runs on it, the visualization platforms, depending of course on the, on the, on the service, the cloud service that the customer has, um, has opted for. The customer's responsibility on the other hand is security in the cloud. It is often, like I said earlier, determined by the cloud services that a customer consumes. For example, infrastructure as a service would be completely different from software as a service in terms of security responsibilities. Note that um, cloud services provider have zero visibility into customer data, and all access is fully controlled by the customer. Their applications are there to secure and control throughout their life cycle, ensuring that data is secured from malicious misuse or intrusion. Customers are also responsible for all facets of um, identity and access management, IAM, including authentication and authorization mechanisms, your single sign-ons, your multi-factor authentication that um, our, our Cisco friends and, and Fortinet talked about earlier, your access keys, um, certificates, all the way up to um, password management. Basically, when an enterprise runs and manages its own IT infrastructure on premises, it is responsible for, that for the security of that infrastructure, as well as the applications and data that resides on it. But the moment that particular organization now moves to the cloud, it hands over, but not necessarily all, of these um, security responsibilities to the cloud services provider. Um, there are different um, security, standards and security standards and compliance certifications um, that a customer can use to satisfy themselves when and choosing a cloud services provider. Some of them are like your PCI DSS um, that governs our things around payments. Um, there is um, HIPAA, there is GDPR. There's, there's quite a, a, a number of them that you, uh, somebody can, can look through them to satisfy themselves um, in terms of who, who to go for. Um, data sovereignty, on the other hand, um, one must note that in most instances, this is a country-specific requirement where data is subjected to the laws of the country in which it is collected or processed. In Botswana, we have the, the Data Protection Act of 2018, which governs this space. I think there will be a presentation earlier um, on Data Protection Act by Rema Siha. He will take you um, in, in, in further detail into, into, into the act and what um, it, it entails. Um, the purpose of the um, Data Protection Act of 2018 is to regulate protection of personal data and to ensure that privacy of individuals in relation to their personal data is maintained. Um, just as an example, across the border, um, the South African Information Regulator recently um, announced the enforcement of the, the POPIA, the Protection of Personal Information Act, whose purpose also is to protect individuals from harm by protecting their, their personal information. Um, the, the cloud, by nature, is very, very distributed. Um, for example, hyperscalers such as your Microsoft Azure, your Amazon Web Services, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, just to mention a few, those are the leaders, so I'll just talk to those ones. They have um, data centers across different regions and locations across the world. It is therefore imperative that data reside in approved locations to meet the requirements of regulators and governments. With the BTC cloud residing in country, in Botswana, the issue of data sovereignty is addressed. So really, um, it, it, it is a no-brainer in terms of um, regulations and requirements for you to be hosting your applications locally. All right, um, I'm just going to take you through now to the, to the BTC data center offerings. We offer a range of flexible cloud service offerings. Um, Colocation is a service that we have at BTC, um, which provides where we provide rented rec space in a high security and highly redundant power and cooling environment to host any business's computing infrastructure. 
This removes the need for customers to build, staff, and manage in-house server rooms. Hence, an opportunity for those customers to then um, focus on their core businesses. The VDC, Virtual Data Center, is a type of cloud service in which a company consumes virtual IT infrastructure services hosted by a public cloud services provider, BTC in this instance. With our cloud service op offering, deploying a cost-effective OPEX-based um, virtual data center infrastructure is made all the more easy. Um, we offer complete in-country VDC solutions consisting of compute, storage, and backup to meet application needs, as well as a dedicated single pane of glass management to ensure 360-degree visibility of your cloud environment. This platform offers both operations and service management for smart self-service and orchestration tools to help customers retain full control of their virtual environments. The VDC solution allows for rapid and agile deployment of data center services or cloud services for a fraction of the cost and time required in traditional IT environments. The VDC solution and all other um, BTC cloud um, services are accessible securely through a variety of connectivity solutions such as your MPLS using both um, layer two and layer three, as well as the internet, of course, um, uh, protected through the, the, the VPNs. Um, private, these private connections are created between the BTC data center and the customer um, premises. The MPLS connection, connections do not go over the public internet. Therefore, they offer more security, more reliability, faster speeds and lower latencies compared to your typical um, internet um, connections. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, our VDC offering um, provides a reduced total cost of ownership with the ability to scale and control your compute and storage usage. Um, it provides optimal performance for your mission critical workloads, as well as a centralized access management for the virtual environment, leveraging cutting edge automation and self-service orchestration tools. Now, powered by, by innovative and intelligent all flash NVMe architecture, BTC offers cloud infrastructure fit to provide enterprises with secure and scalable storage services for any workloads, enabling customers to enjoy low latency and highly available cloud storage. And with our backup as a service offering, customers can backup or replicate their, both their virtual and, and physical environments efficiently and address a full breadth of both recovery point and recovery time objective um, requirements. With the BTC backup as a service allows customers to prevent downtime by securing their critical data with a managed off-site file level backup with secure encryption for data while both in, in transit and while at rest. All right, on, the, on, on, on our cloud partnerships, um, we, we have a, a, part, a partnership with Microsoft um, which, where we provide um, cloud readiness assessments. We provide migration strategy and execution to, to the Azure, Azure Cloud, um, as well as um, the Azure Express route, where we create private connections between the Azure data centers and infrastructure, either on your premises or at the BTC data center if you offer you a colocation service. Um, with, with, with Express route, connections also do not go through the, the public internet, which means um, you get um, you know, better, 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 faster speeds, more reliability, and low latency connected to your, I mean, um, as compared to your, to your internet connections. Um, we also offer modern workspace productivity dashboards, um, which are designed to help organizations have full visibility of their Microsoft 365 adoption. Customers can gain um, insight and detailed understanding into how their organization utilizes various Microsoft um, products and SKUs to optimize their licensing. 
Um, B BTC also offers um, seamless migration to both the BTC Cloud as well as Microsoft Azure. Customers can leverage the expertise and experience of our certified cloud engineers, industry-proven um, migration met methodologies, as well as tools um, and dedicated um, support, because we understand this is a premier service, um, and these are mission-critical um, installations. All right, um, I have, I've, I've come to the end of my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure hosting you on Shift Cloud, and we hope um, to hear from you. Feel free to, to engage um, and send us your inquiries on the email on screen. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Live connected, live digital. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, please welcome to the stage Mohammed El Nema from Microsoft to talk about how remote work can enable connectivity. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm extremely excited to be part of this uh, uh, summit. Um, my name is Mohammed Nimr. I am the Microsoft Business Lead for Modern Work and Security uh, Solutions across our Microsoft Middle East and Africa emerging markets. Um, and today I'll be discussing with you an extremely important topic that we see nowadays, which is really enabling teamwork from anywhere. Um, after, of course, what we've seen in the past year and a year and a half, there have been a lot of changes in how people work. And a lot of businesses started to really prioritize digital transformation and projects to ensure that there is business continuity and uh, that the productivity of their employees and the productivity of the company is actually happening, right? Um, digital transformation projects can be, it's, it's a very broad, it's a very broad term or solutions that can be offered by us, right? It can be virtual events, just like we're doing right now. Uh, it really can be remote working. Um, it can be, you know, contactless anything really like shipping um, or in education. And I believe most of the people have seen how schools, how universities started to go into the remote learning phase, right? And, and started to do everything remotely and manage it remotely. So the past year, year and a half, of the pandemic really started to put on Microsoft, on other technology vendors, on our customers and commercial and public sector customers, um, a lot of pressure on how we can accelerate our own digital transformational projects, regardless of the industry that they have or that they fit in. Now, having said that, I think when we think about it, it's not only about you know um, making sure that we're we're being enabled from a digital transformation perspective, but it's really around realizing the business value and making sure as well that the cost is something that is extremely important. Now, a lot of businesses, of course, were extremely challenged by the pandemic. Um, a lot of businesses started cutting costs. A lot of businesses uh, were financially challenged, right? And making sure that we're realizing that both value and cost has never been more important. Um, and really, we at Microsoft, we try to really, as much as we can, match both to give you the optimal value that we can offer as, as, as a technology vendor, but also make sure that we, we're, we're driving cost optimization for our clients during this time and also moving forward. Now, having said that, I, I really want to spend some time today um, around how Microsoft can enable teamwork from anywhere. Now, we have we've been almost working remotely for a year and a half now since since March to 2020. Um, the the 150,000 employees of the company, right? 
Um, and, and I believe we had fantastic fiscal years. Uh, we just closed one actually a couple of days back uh, with fantastic results. Um, and, and it really required a lot of culture change within the company. And, and that is also what we've seen during the year and a half with our customers. And that's the journey we took them to help them really around uh, enabling them to, to, to work from anywhere. Um, regardless which industry you sit in, regardless if you're a, a white or a blue collar worker, uh, uh, if you're a frontline worker, or if, if you're, you're a person who sits and have their own office or a desk, it really doesn't matter. At, at some point, at some point, out, all the employees today uh, can have the flexibility and can have the option of working remotely. Um, now, today I'm going to touch down on a couple of things, right? First thing is going to be mainly on the meeting experience, right? How can we drive a better meeting experience, a better meeting behavior? Um, how can we really simplify the day-to-day -day with workflows and applications? I think this is something critical to our businesses. And then, of course, how can we sustain employee well-being and productivity, which is key uh, uh, to the success of any organization. If we think about, you know, the meeting experiences and, and, and how can we drive a meeting experience, just one question to ask yourself now is how many meetings have you had in the past, online meetings you've had in the past year and a half? Honestly, I, I probably had thousands, right? I had a lot of conference calls. Um, I've joined a lot of webinars. I joined a lot of uh, events online, just like we're having now. Um, but really, how productive are they? That's that's the key question. And 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 productivity here needs to touch down on multiple things. One of which is really the employee experience that you give to the people that are on the call, um, which makes all the difference in terms of the willingness to really attend a meeting or it's just another conference call that I have to attend, right? We mainly have a lot of lack of follow-up. Um, not all attendees will be online, um, a lot of distractions and all that. So I think with, with the technology that we're offering today on Microsoft Teams, we've really made sure that our enhancements and the product portfolio today can offer the best experience that our customers um, can use. Um, one of those really experiences and, and making sure that we're driving a really effective and a secure meeting is, is, is delivering and engaging in an inclusive meeting from anywhere, right? But I believe more importantly, the collaboration, having access to your Microsoft tools, having access to your first party Microsoft tools like Office 365 as an example, within your Microsoft Teams really brings the edge of integration. It brings the edge that you can collaborate on Teams during your conference call, making sure that you and your team members are working on things or documents. At the same time, being in a conference call after the conference call as follow-ups as well, which really bridges a bit the gap, you know, between working, but also driving a remote, a remote meeting. Um, so that level of integration that we have via our Microsoft first party applications, as well as Microsoft Teams, gives um, a more effective um, way of working with Microsoft Teams, right? Um, the second thing is really, and, and those I love, honestly, the features that we have on Microsoft Teams, right? Um, most of you are familiar with, you know, the conferencing call features, but we've uh, 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 earlier this year, we've introduced some new features, right? We've introduced some virtual space, so shared virtual space for you, for your team members to be sat in, you know, a classroom, an auditorium, uh, um, in different, completely different modes. But also the dive, the the live webinars and the uh, video broadcasts that we have for large audiences. So if you're at, as an example throwing a town hall, you want to 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 um, to have um, a conference call for all your employees at the company, 
there is definitely the option to drive that. And I believe more importantly, having the customization of their background. A lot of people nowadays don't feel comfortable if they're working from home or if they're working remotely or they're on the road. A lot of people don't feel comfortable to share what's what's in their background. Um, and with that, of course, we gave the people the flexibility uh, around blurring your background, around putting uh, different themes behind you, right, that, that you want to just simply cover your background. One of the other things that, that honestly to me is my favorite, if you have a lot of people in your household, um, is really around uh, the background noise that you can really uh, make sure that you, you activate it, right? And activate it um, uh, with background cancellation feature within Microsoft Teams, which really enables you to not only have your background blurred, but also have any noise around you uh, at some, um, any noise around you really canceled. Uh, which will make you as an employee more focused around your conference call, but also more importantly, the attendees in that conference call can actually uh, be extremely focused on you alone. <clears throat> the, 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 the second topic is really around, you know, the apps and the workflows. And this is my favorite, this is my favorite functionality that we've seen. And this is um, one piece of technology that we've integrated within Microsoft Teams that we've seen it being adopted by a lot of customers across Africa. Um, in other words, when we think about it, processes, applications exist in any uh, company today, right? And it can be, it can vary from line of business applications that you have um, it can be something manual that you have that you normally spend a lot of time on, um, or it can be some sort of a bot application or, or uh, uh, some sort of a horizontal application that anyone from the company can use, be it a company communicator, being an HR bot or a support bot. So any type of really application that you have um, as of today. The beauty here is that our vision for Microsoft Teams is to become the hub for teamwork, right? It, the, 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 our, our extreme value proposition here is we can leverage Teams to drive, of course, conference calls, to drive chatting, to drive collaboration through first party Microsoft applications, but also to drive other LOB or third party applications on top of Teams, which eventually is going to make Microsoft Teams the hub for your teamwork. Um, we've seen that cultural change happen at Microsoft. We've seen that cultural change during um, our last fiscal year, which ended on the 30th of June, uh, happened with a lot of our customers as well, um, where they're really starting leveraging Teams as, as the hub. And now, Really, a couple of things. There is a Microsoft Teams store that obviously you can really download applications such as Adobe Sign for eSignature. Um, you can uh, download over thousands of applications sitting in the Teams store where you can simply just activate it or, or, or deploy it quickly on Microsoft Teams. But more importantly, you can automate your workflows with no code and no code tools, right? Uh, obviously using um, uh, 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 Power Apps, right? Uh, or any other third-party application that can be integrated. Um, what we've seen as well, really uh, uh, boosting the productivity of a lot of their, our customers and a lot of our employees is um, what we call, you know, horizontal simple applications that we as Microsoft have built for our customers. Those applications vary between um, simple bots that you can uh, really deploy in, 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 in minutes time and have it on top of Microsoft Teams to things like communi company communicator to communicate with your team through Teams um, versus email um, or even uh, 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 things like, you know, check in and check out at work, et cetera. All of that can really get integrated towards, uh, towards one single hub of, of Teams. So we've seen a lot of pickup happening today 
that our customers are really pushing us to expand the portfolio of, 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 of this platform to start integrating as much as we can applications that are core to their businesses, making sure it's streamlined, streamlined to what they're using as of today. Um, this is just a, a quick glimpse really around some of the consolidated applications that we have. Um, as you can see, some of them are really around HR, some of them are around finance, some of them are around productivity, like Adobe Sign, as I mentioned, which is an e-signature application, uh, Survey Monkey, um, uh, which is really a survey bot uh, that you can leverage with you and with your team. So a lot of applications uh, with different functionalities that definitely you can start integrating it to your platform. Um, and the pickup really was insane uh, the, in, the, in the past in the past period. We've seen a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of customers that are interested to start integrating what they have towards uh, the platform. And then, to me, I think at the end of the day, it boils down to the employee well-being and productivity. Right? Um, we live in a world today that really requires us to be um, always online, uh, always available. Um, the demand of the market today is, 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 uh, is requiring all of us really to be there. Um, and especially if, if, if everyone is working from remote, remote countries, remote jobs, uh, remote locations, um, the employee well-being and productivity matters, and it matters a lot. Um, to me, we've introduced what we've called Microsoft Viva. Microsoft Viva is basically a product that has different modules. One of those modules, and it is integrated on Microsoft Teams, one of those modules is what we call employee well-being and productivity, and it's called Viva Insights. Um, what Viva Insights does, it really provides you insights for the leaders of the company, for the managers of the company, and for the individuals of the company. As you can see on the screen, really the insights for leaders, it gives you a, a, a bird's eye view on the full organization, right? It gives you a full on view in terms of the activity, the weekly collaboration hours um, between you know, different teams, um, whether you know engineering teams, marketing teams, sales teams, et cetera. It starts really to provide you with this data, with this analytics at a bird's eye view on how the company is working today, uh, specifically if you're heavy on online meetings, you're heavy on uh, remote meetings. Um, and then if we switch into the insights for managers, it gives really a kind of a double click a bit around you know, the team and not necessarily at an individual level, because of course we really respect the privacy of, of everyone in any company, but it gives a view around the actual team that that manager manages, right? So as a ballpark number, uh, how many hours the team are spending on conference calls, how many hours are they spending on emails and really optimizing that accordingly. Because at the end of the day, we can really be spending a lot of times, a lot of hours doing that, and no one above us would realize whether a manager or a leader um, or a company owner. But really with Viva Insights, it gives that view on how the team is behaving and how the team is working in such a, 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 a remote environment. And then finally, of course, um, which is something I personally use, um, which is Viva Insights uh, for individuals, right? So this boils down at an individual level where any individual in the organization can really have visibility, you know, on, on their quiet days, how many quiet days with no meetings, with no online presence is happening, um, my focus time, uh, how many emails are going in and out per day, how many teams interactions I'm having, some analytics as well of things that I need to do for my day and all of that. So it really boils down and double clicks a bit on my personal individual uh, insights that um, the Viva Insights can provide you to, to give you the right 
uh, the right view and the right technology to empower you to manage your day, to manage how you work more efficiently. A lot of us sometimes can really get caught up at work, uh, but if we really don't reflect and pause and take a couple of step backs and start to look at our behavior in terms of our working patterns, we can really get, get, get lost pretty quickly. So I believe personally, this is one of my favorite features that I've been using um, uh, and I'm looking forward and exciting for the rest to, to, to be using. Um, thank you so much for today. Uh, I hope the session was helpful. I look forward to connecting with each and every one of you. Um, and please do enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Mohammed. And now we're going to be heading out to, to, to have lunch, but please stay on the line and just keep the line still engaged. Noting very well that the virtual booths and all the interactive uh, sections of this presentation are still available. So we'll see you at 12.35. Back from our lunch break, this is still Digital Shift BW, powered by BTC, and my name is still Giselle. Well, we continue with the theme that we had commenced on just before lunch, which is, of course, a shift cloud, and we have several conversations or presentations, rather, in that regard. For one, digital transformation of SMMEs using cloud technology, data protection, ACT, and cybersecurity framework. But first up is solving business growth challenges by automating process Processes, alerts, and redundant tasks. To guide us through this presentation from RPC Data is Nitin Sanji. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome to you to this presentation on accelerating business growth with integration and automation. A little bit about myself. Um, I was founded in 1978, Zambia, and I've been in Botswana for some time. I'm an alumni of Northside, uh, MAP, and Martis Bay. Um, I was in US for about 16 years, um, after which I came back to Botswana. I am a perpetual student, uh, like we all are, and obviously the more I learn, uh, the less I know. Um, I'm a father of two lovely, lovely daughters and a husband to a very lucky wife. You know, I can say that now. Uh, my favorite two quotes are from Peter Drucker, and, and that is management is doing, the right, is doing things right, whereas leadership is doing the right things. And similar to that quote is there's nothing more useless uh, than doing something that shouldn't be done. A little bit about RPC data. Uh, we have and were founded in 1989. Uh, we have had over 120 plus engagements. Uh, most of our implementations were large scale implementations for the governments. And, uh, you know, we were one of the very few companies in Botswana uh, to have exported ICT services. Um, we are also one of the handful of Oracle partners um, to have earned a service expertise in Oracle EBS as well as Oracle database. Okay, in terms of major engagements, uh, we're across the board. Uh, we have done major engagements with the government of Botswana. We have done uh, major engagements with, uh, with, uh, with Zambia, as well as uh, Kenya. Okay. In terms of celebrating you know, our 32 years in, in Botswana, 
um, you know, wanted to highlight some of the partners that we have worked with and uh, to highlight some of the key services that we provide. Uh, so obviously we've got ICT consulting, we've got project management, and we do public sector engagements. So, in, well, now we're ready for our first punchline. Integration and automation will not accelerate business. Uh, so despite the title of the, of the presentation, uh, integration and automation will not accelerate your business. However, it will optimize your non-value added activities. So when we think of freeing up leadership time, which I believe is actually being used a lot in non-value added activities, optimizing your non-value added activities will free up their time. Um, the other key drivers of growth obviously are skilled people and relationships. Innovation, marketing, and obviously financing and optimizing how you allocate your, your equity. The key point with integration and, and automation is that it will empower the decision makers with intelligence uh, to monitor the performance of their business model, but make informed decisions and uncover opportunities for growth and improvement. So before we go on and discuss integration and automation, I think it's important that we all get a reality check. Uh, specifically to your SMEs and, and private sector. We talk about growth, but we all understand that growth itself is a luxury, as many organizations in this current uh, state are just trying to remain afloat. We're all having to deal with a far more complex supplier network. You know, in the past, it was okay to have one or two suppliers, uh, but now we're having to, uh, to deal with suppliers um, locally and internationally across multiple global regions. Um, technology has brought a completely new competitive space to, to Botswana, where now local companies are having to compete with, uh, with international uh, players. Consumer attitudes are changing dramatically. Um, I think, you know, with, the, uh, with, with Facebook and social media, uh, customers are expecting differentiated products and exceptional service. Uh, the regulatory environment is changing rapidly. Uh, changing work cultures, extended enterprises. You know, in the past it was okay to have one location or one branch, but now businesses to remain competitive are required to expand their reach to not only nationally, but also outside of Botswana. Choices are paralyzing decision-making. I, I can't begin to describe um, how commonplace this is. Um, a lot of leaders are faced with so many choices that they end up not making a single choice. And then lastly, strategy is not about what you do, it's about what you not do. And when we're focusing on what to do, uh, we, we, we do lose out. For public uh, and parastatals, uh, we realize that you know, uh, customer expectations are changing. Uh, we're in this Facebook world where customers are expecting to receive the same kind of service uh, from their parastatals as they would from, um, from, uh, from international companies. Customers are demanding digital engagement. Nobody wants to stay in the line. Nobody wants to submit an application. They want to do this all online. Automation is no longer sufficient. You need to measure your processes. You need to be able to have a dashboard of those measures and continuously improve them. Risk compliance and governance requirements have matured. We understand now uh, that parastatals themselves are required uh, to, uh, you know, to advise governments on risk compliance and governments as it pertains to their particular organization. Intergovernment, interparastatal integration. So it's not enough for the parastatal to operate in isolation or in silos. It's critical where the, uh, where the parastatals are working hand in hand with other government departments as well as other parastatals. And then cost optimizations. So here's a punchline. Cash may be king, but poor inventory management and control closes businesses. So to remain competitive in this day and age, we need to learn and adapt our business model efficiently and predict changes and respond proactively. We need to introduce differentiated products and services quickly 
and build quality assurance and continuous improvement into our business processes. No longer should we be satisfied with operating in our own well, in our own silos. We have to look beyond our current, uh, current market and explore markets outside of Botswana. So we'll start with defining what integration is. Uh, integration is the networking of business functions, internal and, and external stakeholders to achieve unity of effort in which the whole is greater than the sum of parts. So we connect and orchestrate centrally your financial purchasing, sales, inventory, and human capital processes with the external environment. Intelligence across enterprise versus silos in real time. So an advantage of, of integration is that as opposed to getting intelligence about your particular department or your particular function, you now are able to gather intelligence across your enterprise and also from the external environment. Elimination of duplicate, uh, well, elim eliminates uh, duplication of tasks and data, enhances accountability, transparency, and compliance, removes duplication of work, and so that's what we have with integration. Uh, with automation, you know, there's a famous quote by Bill Gates that said, you know, the first rule of any technology used in business is that automation applied to, to an efficient pro operation will magnify the efficiency. So here are some of the benefits of automation. Automation is a process of eliminating manual activities. So we reduce rework, we improve predictability, and if you improve predictability, you're able to improve it. Uh, you improve measurability, capacity, as well as you reduce the turnaround time. So there are benefits of, of automation. But on the other hand, the second <laughs> is that automation applied to inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. So again, I can't stress this point enough. I mean, if you consider the, uh, the, all the automation activities that I've undertaken, I mean, if you're automating an inefficient operation, you're just making it more inefficient. Organizations run through, run through valuable resources on automation often performed in silos without considering the impact on other interdependent functions. Not all processes require automation. Automation may have an impact on humans and is a costly affair yielding nominal gains. So now that we have integration, we have automation. We have ready for another punchline. Automation without integration is like putting sports wheels on a donkey cart. You need to have both automation and integration in your organization to really reap the benefits of both. So when we think of digital transformation, uh, a model that we wanted to present with respect to digital transformation is where you, 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 inter you, you bring in integration as well as automation, and you create a model where your enterprise is connected to the cloud and is able to access your integration tools, as well as your automation tools. The big advantage with, uh, with this particular model is that it's completely integrated and automated. It's secure. Um, you don't have to worry about data residency. Um, it's scalable. Um, you don't have to, again, worry about performance. But I think, for me, the, the most important part is how easily you're able to adapt to changes in the environment. So if your business requires, if your business model requires you to open up a branch in, say, Maun, or requires you to open up a branch, say, in Zambia, so whereas it may have taken months for you to go live, having this particular model where you have your enterprise applications hosted on the cloud, uh, you're able to go live with your branches as well as your international locations in a matter of, of weeks. Uh, when we think about capital investment, um, uh, one of the hurdles of, of innovating that a lot of small to medium enterprises experience is the large capital investment they have to undertake. And so sometimes that dissuades them from innovating. So by having a model where your enterprise applications are on the cloud, you're able to innovate your business model a lot more quickly, a lot more cheaply, validate your business model, and then take that next step. So with that, I wanted to introduce SAP Business One as an integrated system of, as, an, as a system that integrates all your business functions. So when we think of SAP Business One and iDuella, uh, you, manage your, uh, you manage your business, uh, you, you have accounting, inventory, production, HR, project, 
sales and service, purchasing and operations. And around all of that, you're able to do your analytics, you're able to integrate with third-party systems, and your extended enterprise with your customers as well as your suppliers, as well as mobile technologies. So you have your entire business in the palm of your hand. Um, add to that, uh, SAP Business One is future ready. So when we think about uh, cloud technologies, machine learning, and Internet of Things, all of this is built into, into SAP Business One. iDueller, made for Botswana, for Botswana. I'm proud to state uh, that iDueller is uh, one of a handful of locally built software systems that address the needs of the HR and payroll requirements of small to medium organizations and provides an organization with a complete suite of, of automation for your HR and payroll activities. So it's built and supported in Botswana. It's fully integrated with B1. Um, it com it, it's a complete HR automation for your organization. It's completely compliant with local legislation and offers workflow and approvals as well as employee self-service. So this is a complete tool that something was not available to small to medium enterprises, which now can be delivered together with B1 and that too over a cloud. So is my last punchline. <laughs> so with punchline is, you know, for more information, call our support line, complaints department. Thank you, be safe and be well. Thank you very much for that very wonderful presentation. Um, so now we're going to call Mr. Cecil Masicha from the Department of IT, from the Ministry of Transport and Communication, to talk about cybersecurity and the Data Protection Act. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cecil Masira from the Minister of Transport and Communications, Director Responsible for Policy Development and the ICT Division. Today, my presentation will cover cybersecurity and data protection with a, a look at the Botswana framework. Uh, my presentation will take you through the background, uh, noting the national cybersecurity strategy, its aspects, and what it deals with, and then a look at the, the Data Protection Act of 2018 uh, and discuss the way forward. Um, as a way of background, uh, I would like to, for us to appreciate the definition of the word cybersecurity. It's a whole host of uh, things, including the collection of tools, policies, security concepts, safeguards, etc., with the intention and aim of protecting the cyber environment and organizations, uh, including the users' assets. When you look at this uh, term cybersecurity, we need to note that it includes, this assets includes connected computing devices, personnel, infrastructure, applications, services, and among us other things, where th those which are involved in the totality of transmitted and stored uh, information. Um, uh, the aim is to strive for attainment of, uh, uh, of, of security of, of these uh, aspects. Um, there are multiple dimensions of cyber security among us, which it includes uh, governance structures, risk management, uh, incident management, as well as protection of critical national information infrastructure. In Botswana, we have described this as water finance, um, transport, communications, uh, etc., including public safety. We will note also that legislation and policy measures are included in this definition, including the vital international and regional co co cooperation <coughs> and collaboration with other states. When you look at this in totality, we should as understand that it also covers cloud-specific capabilities that are very vital in this uh, aspect that are normally not covered in uh, uh, traditional security. We also should understand the aim and intention is to preserve and make a data available, ensuring its integrity at all times and identifying and controlling such sensitive information uh, in someone's uh, uh, systems. When you talk about cloud uh, technology, you're talking really about uh, 
systems that belong to someone else and therefore the threat of protection and compliance to various standards that we, we are adopting and adapting to our environment is really vital including the threat intelligence uh, encryption and uh, many others. Intertwined to this word, uh, cyber security is uh, cyber crime. And we'll note, as I've already discussed, that it's really about uh, cyber security, about protection of government and corporate networks, including the individual users themselves. Uh, whereas cyber crime is really focusing on protection of individuals and families as they navigate uh, in the online. Uh, uh, this. It's really intertwined for all purpose and intent. Um, uh, Botswana has grown phenomenally to depend on ICTs in many aspects of, uh, of its economy and social being. Uh, we note that um, Information systems in finance, uh, communications, as I've already indicated, and many others, as I've described in my slide there, uh, are really important to the continuation of life in Botswana and the growth of its. Uh, but obviously, this uh, uh, critical national information infrastructure are vulnerable to threats and risks uh, committed by state and non-state actors. Uh, states have been noted to have developed ICT capabilities that are used for wars and conflicts and therefore it's really vital that we protect this in our environment. Whereas when you look at specifically data protection, it it's deals with set of procedures and that safeguard personal data stored within systems, safeguarding sensitivity sensitive uh, information and describing your operational backups and business continuity in case of disaster. However, I want to submit to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that it's really vital we combine data protection and cyber security, essentially because we know that data and system protec protocols can be damaged in the same attack. Uh, and therefore, the teams for data protection and the teams for security must combine their efforts uh, ensure that the survivability of that system, even in the eventuality of an attack, uh, is, is, is guaranteed and minimum damage is realized. We note also by combining this too that we're controlling all stages of uh, data life cycle, ensuring compliance of uh, applicable regulations, making it very easy to do that. Uh, and cyber security risks can essentially compromise data security. This is why, why we really need to combine the two. In Botswana, we have developed a national cyber security strategy whose uh, vision is really to attain cyber security for all by 2022 and beyond with the mission to protect this critical national information infrastructure, building capacity and capabilities. We are sitting at about 200 professionals as a country at this present moment in time, whereas we should, uh, as the studies have shown have a minimum of 5,000 uh, cyber security specialists uh, and therefore we need to ramp up this. There are six strategic objectives in the strategy among us to which uh, is uh, achieving a secure and resilient cyberspace, enhancing capacity and capability. Under uh, strategic objective one, it includes uh, ensuring harmonization of our data protection acts and any other uh, essential uh, act that is in place, like your cyber crime and computer related uh, crime act of 2018. Uh, this are uh, also included. Under each of these strategic objectives, uh, if I said, as I've alluded to it, uh, we have <coughs> development and review of uh, policies and legislations uh, that must happen. The data protection as, as it sits at today, it needs to be harmonized to other laws that are in place at this moment and including the envisaged cyber security law that we are already in the process of developing as a country and uh, we know that um, we have already achieved some progress in relation to the cyber security strategy, including its approval and the establishment of the communication set, which will be used to, uh, as a, a, a body that will be uh, looking at the cyber threats and risks that emanate from our country. We have already established the data digital cyber forensic lab. Um, the Data Protection Act seeks to regulate the uh, protection of personal data, uh, ensuring that the privacy of individuals in relation to their personal data, where, whether it is in the cloud 
or is stored in country uh, within systems that are in our country are protected. It also seeks to establish your information and data protection commission, which is a body that will be overseeing uh, the implementation of this act and other ancillary matters there too. Uh, there are various provisions and parts of this law, uh, among us to which there is so that, that specifically discusses uh, the powers of the Commission in relation to processing of personal data, uh, the requirements and criteria for processing data, uh, processing of sensitivity sensitive uh, personal data, collection of this data and the right to access. As a way forward in Botswana, we seek to review our cyber crime and computer related act, crime act. This emanates precisely because among of, of uh, among us other reasons uh, that new technologies have come about your 4 IR your internet of things uh, and including cloud computing which were not uh, noted in the beginning when this uh, act was um, uh, in, uh, developed we are in the process of developing a cyber security bill and as well as, as uh, establishing structures and undertaking various initiatives this is what we are doing as Botswana. I thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Masira. So a lot has been said about uh, cloud computing and how organizations can leverage the power of cloud computing at a high level. But the next speaker is going to talk about how small medium enterprises can actually take advantage of cloud computing to catapult and leverage that power to grow their business. Mr. Kenneth Simons. Let's admit it, the way digital transformation and SMMEs on the same line is unheard of, particularly in the context of Botswana. I'm here to tell you about what cloud technology has been able to assist SMMEs to do, uh, once again, particularly in the context of Botswana. My name is Kenneth Mutsidisi Sitimela. I'm the founder and managing director of Leverage Point. My presentation is quite simple. I will tell you a little bit about us. I'll give you context of whom are we referring to as SMMEs. I will give you the context of Botswana in terms of what is currently happening. A number of speakers have spoken about it throughout this morning. And lastly, a case study. We are a startup company that has been in existence since 2018. Um, and out of the slide, I also just want to highlight that we do a lot of our work on software development, uh, website and mobile applications and concentrate a lot today on the products that we have built, uh, particularly Business Point, a software uh, technology for small businesses. We have a good footprint in terms of having to assist both government and the private sector. Um, but let me delve more on what I'm here to tell you about SMMEs. Small and medium enterprises uh, are regarded as the backbone of every economy. And at a time when COVID has hit literally every country, uh, it becomes quite important for us to uh, be concentrating our efforts on those that are able to diversify um, the economy at, faster, uh, at a faster rate. Firstly, SMMEs are extremely cost sensitive. They are the type of people that prefer to simplify their work while also ensuring that on a day-to-day -day basis, they are able to meet payroll. Secondly, uh, SMMEs are generally small organization in nature. And by SMMEs, we are basically talking companies that have about 10 to 50 people. And uh, that character is usually of having a very minimal amount of technology. But when we talk about digital, pro digital uh, transformation, Foremost, we are talking about digitization of processes and making sure that each and everything that is being done uh, within the company is paperless. 
Is this possible? Yes. Uh, one, how do we achieve this? Firstly, by being aware of the technologies that are available. Secondly, by continuously ensuring that we adopt uh, and have a culture of, of digitization in terms of everything that we are doing. That is how we eventually achieve digital transformation. In, in, in Botswana, uh, this is possible uh, because SME means by their very own nature, they prefer user-friendly solutions, um, and secondly, they prefer uh, the cost of ownership to be very low in terms of everything. In Botswana, we are finding quite a lot of complex solutions that are usually meant for large uh, companies as opposed to the small one. And these software solutions require quite a lot of uh, customization. I'm introducing you to Business Point, a locally developed ERP software solution specific to small businesses. Once again, when I talk about small businesses, I'm talking about companies that have between 10 and 50. Uh, this, the introduction of an ERP solution in the form of Business Point is going to give everybody an opportunity to have a comprehensive oversight in terms of uh, their business operations. Secondly, uh, it will also assist in terms of having to measure profitability by paying attention to literally everything that is happening from sales, from inventory, stock control, um, and even uh, application of leaves. Uh, leaves are one of the most expensive things that uh, small businesses have to deal with. And obviously, uh, assistance in terms of adherence to statutory uh, uh, requirements such as taxation and submission of requirements from uh, the likes of Botswana Unified Revenue Services. Information is gold. Having information is everything for just about every business. Business Point has a customer relationship management system, uh, a sales module, purchasing, a product and services, inventory, customer support, and a comprehensive HR management uh, module, together with project management and reports that are able to assist to measure and see what is happening in as far as one's business is concerned. Like I said, the ERP software solution has been designed precisely for small businesses within Botswana. Uh, we offer both cloud and private deployment. I will show it to you as I talk about the case studies of some of the clients that we have implemented this in. And most importantly, uh, adherence to financial and statutory requirements. Interestingly, SMMEs are very mobile. They can be anywhere at any time, and they do not want to be restricted. Uh, when they found themselves with COVID-19, it meant that those that have number of businesses around needed to make sure that what is happening in their enterprises, they have that information at the palm of their hand. And I can assure you that's what Business, op business Point offers you. Hang on. We talked about this being possible because of cloud technology. And you ask myself, what is cloud technology? Back in the days, before implementing an ERP software solution, one had to have uh, a very expensive data centers. And the, uh, the availability of uh, software as a service, as a model that has been implemented in as far as cloud technology is concerned, gives us an opportunity not to worry about the cost of data centers. It's plug and play. Come in. Uh, we do the trainings, we do the necessary in terms of ensuring that we migrate all of your information and that whole hand-holding that we will provide together with cloud technology assist us to be able to achieve this. You don't have to worry about antiviruses because uh, cloud technology would have um, that, that available on, on a daily basis. There is decreased cost of ownership in terms of uh, having a comprehensive ERP solution. The upgrades and maintenance, you don't have to worry about such, um, and the, it's a very easy to use platform. And what is, when, when I said that SMMEs are quite cost sensitive, this is precisely why it then becomes important to make sure that the cost of ownership of any solution that they're getting um, becomes possible. There is ease of support and maintenance through calling our help desk 
or we are able to remotely log in and assist you in terms of uh, making sure that your business is operating, making sure that you are able to monitor your business wherever you are without worrying about this. We are well known as a diamond company, uh, or rather a diamond country. But the truth of the matter is quite a lot of digital transformation agenda has been ongoing within our country. Foremost, reliability of electricity throughout all the corners of this country. Uh, there's a growing fiber, print, fiber footprint. Uh, just recently, we were talking about having more than 10,000 kilometers of fiber throughout the, the country. There is skilled and literate graduates uh, within Botswana. And there is an improving legislature that assists and allows uh, in terms of monitoring cybersecurity, in terms of ensuring data protection, and ensuring that cloud computing becomes possible within the country. We, we are told about data centers such as BTC Centraga as one of the growing products. It is our hope that eventually we will come and utilize this, this product as well. And there is a cultural shift in as far as adoption of technologies concerned within the country. Um, like I said, we've made it possible. Foremost, meet a close to 70-year-old Rem Monani. He's in manufacturing. He does curtains. He, you walk in and walk out with your trousers. But we made it possible for him to be able to uh, be part of the digital transformation by uh, automating his business processes and also meet this young gentleman who is into agriculture. We provided business point to him so that he can be able to monitor his farming enterprise in terms of all the sales that he's doing, in terms of all, uh, 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 all the payments that he's making and receiving, in terms of ensuring that there is the dashboards that allow him to have information at the palm of his hand. Um, and quite interestingly, uh, integration becomes uh, an important component of digital transformation, particularly those that already have systems in place. We have integrated uh, Business Point in one of the camps in the tourism sector. They are running about 12 camps, and through integration of Business Point, they were able to uh, increase and improve on the cycles that they have to follow in terms of procurement of uh, the different amenities that they have to provide. The Delta is a bit um, uh, difficult to deal with. The transportation is not easy. You need information at the palm of your hand to continuously make decisions. And because of COVID, we have seen quite a huge growth in terms of uh, the adoption of this, this technology. In conclusion, they say that when digital transformation is done right, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when it is not done the right way, all you have is a really fast caterpillar. Uh, in conclusion, once again, congratulations to BTC on reaching 40th anniversary. It is my hope and it is my belief that we will transform uh, and assist SMMEs to be digitally transformed. I thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Stimela. It's very encouraging to learn what a lot of other young people are doing in this country. From an innovation perspective, I feel very encouraged by your presentation. So next, we're gonna now shift and transition over to a panel discussion that will cover cloud computing as a topic. Some of the speakers who've been on the stage just now will be in that panel discussion, so please look forward to that in the next couple of seconds. I'm going to talk to you about two propositions that we offer as BTC to our customers. The first proposition is our digital services consulting. This is where we come into your environment and we do a comprehensive audit of your infrastructure, of your network and systems. And once we do this audit, it will then inform us on the specific requirements that you need as an enterprise. In actual fact, research has shown that 
there is 50 to 60 percent of wastage of licenses and services that are bought but are not consumed because of oversubscription. So this is where we come in as BTC to help you optimize your investment. When we come into your environment, we use our assessment tools. Using these assessment tools, we can help you optimize your investment into the future. With our end-to-end -end sales offering as BTC, we have become a one-stop shop to allow you to buy all your digital services, all your broadband connectivity through BTC. This requires reliable broadband connectivity. As BTC, we offer high-speed broadband connectivity. And obviously that comes, for us, it comes with cost effectiveness. For just 55 Pula, you can buy from us storage capacity of one terabyte. And for just 515 Pula, you can buy a domain name, registration of domain and hosting of the domain in our data center facility. The other service we are offering as BTC is security as a service. Security as a service allows you to secure your environment, to secure your connectivity without the need of a physical firewall hardware at your premises because we offer it right at our data center. It is an important service today, especially when there is this rampant cyber crime. As BTC, we will be introducing in the near future new services, advanced services such as Microsoft Azure. This is one powerful solution, powerful platform that is going to help customers, especially if they want to go into data analytics without the need for them to have to buy high and expensive servers. Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion, which is a conversation that we will carry on with regards to cloud computing. You see, historically, the, the pride and joy of one an IT manager was to have a, a, you know, a cacophony of uh, servers humming in the back of their office in what's typically a very cold room. And this was conversations they would have about how big my room is versus your, your room. So now today, what has actually since happened, if, if crude simplification is really about moving all of that externally and typically uh, hosting it and having it with uh, what is typically a third party provider that provides the hosting services of the applications of the enterprise as a service. To have a conversation about cloud computing, I have a couple of gentlemen here with me uh, who are forming a panel to discuss cloud computing and the benefits of cloud computing to your enterprise, whether large, medium, or small. I really do think that uh, there's a need to dilute this, this gentlemanly <laughs> camaraderie at some point. But um, I'm going to let them introduce each themselves. So I'm just going to give you each um, about 30 seconds just to introduce yourself uh, for the viewers at home to, to understand what you do and uh, what, your, what your vocation is. OK. Um, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Tsapo Mongalo. I am head of IT infrastructure at BTC. Um, my portfolio um, covers um, you know, the, 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 the data center where we offer cloud services as well as um, the colocation service. Um, I also, I'm also responsible for, for, for the IT infrastructure section wh which covers um, the, the, the enterprise network, IT service management within BTC, um, as well as as, as well as um, you know your databases, operating systems. So that all that portfolio falls um, under under me at BTC. Thank you. Okay, great, uh, Mr. Kapalis. Uh, good morning. My name is Chokanezo Kapalis, and I work for Bokra, which is Botswana Communication Regulatory Authority, as a Chief Technology Officer. 
I'm actually responsible for their IT network. But in addition to the IT network which they do have, it's actually I'm also responsible for the issue of cyber security, ensuring that you know, cyber security adherence is done. You know, looking at the whole communication sector, we have just recently established what we call a communication computer incident response team for the communication sector in order to be proactively monitoring what are the issues and so that we can want the constituencies to address that issue of cyber security. But in addition to this, we have other laws which uh, BOCRA is responsible for implementing. One of them is called the Electronic Communication and Transaction Act. And that act actually gave BOCRA a mandate to deal with the issue of electronic signatures in terms of the accreditation. Because as we more and more move towards the using the electronic means, we need to make sure that we sign with proper electronic signature, which can be authenticated and repudiated. So we are responsible for accrediting what we call secure electronic signatures providers. And it's an act which is also under my portfolio. And in addition, there is another act which is called Electronic Records Evidence Act, which also BOCRA has a responsibility of you know, certifying electronic record system. And we do actually also fall under my mandate to deal with those. So really, that is the portfolio which I'm currently doing with BOCRA. Thank you. Sangi. Good afternoon. My name is Nitin Sangi, and <coughs> I work for RPC Data as a strategist, but pretty much a jack of all trades. Uh, my key role is really helping businesses um, understand and, and chart out a roadmap on transforming their organization from where they are into the cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Sangi. Good afternoon. My name is Kenneth Motsili Sisitimela. I'm the founder and managing director of Leverage Point. Our philosophy is inclined towards software development, particularly uh, assisting the country towards achieving digital transformation and the knowledge economy. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those introductions, gentlemen. Um, I'm just going to start it very simple. And I'm going to ask that we keep it very simple and very English uh, because, because of um, uh, the fact that not all our listeners are techie people, or, no, or not all our watchers are techie people. So I'm going to throw this at you, um, sir, to say, in very simple terms, how would you define, um, how would you define a cloud service provider, what you would call a cloud service provider? OK. Um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, um, a cloud services provider is, is, is an entity um, that actually runs um, cloud services and offers them, okay, it, and offers them to, to customers out there. Um, mm -hmm. th these, these, are, these are offered in different, um, in different um, deployment models. Um, it could be, it could be, in most cases, um, a cloud services provider basically is responsible for running the data centers um, and the IT infrastructure um, mm -hmm. that is responsible for hosting um, those, those services for, for those particular customers. Yeah. Um, the, the, the cloud services provider's responsibility in this case is to ensure that, um, you know, the, the, is to ensure that there's, there's physical equipment um, and running the data center on a day-to-day -day basis, um, ensuring that um, instead of the customers running these um, um, services themselves in their IT server rooms, wherever they are, um, it's a service that is uh, offered by the, the, the cloud services provider um, to, 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 the, to those customers. So basically, um, your, your, your duty is to, to do your day-to-day -day, um, IT operations. It, it's basically um, information technology as a service. Yeah. Um, and there are different um, service models that are available um, to, 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 to our customers. Um, one of them, um, I'm, I'm just going to take it maybe a bit too, uh, back a bit um, to start with the co-location. Um, because co-location can also be seen as some kind of a, a cloud service. Because um, what happens is a customer can actually collocate their, their hardware at a cloud services provider. Yeah. But really, um, when, we come, when, when we really talk about cloud, now we are talking about hosting um, applications. That, like I said, there are different um, service models. The most common being um, infrastructure as a service, where as a cloud services provider, you, you provide the infrastructure yeah. um, from the physical buildings, um, ensuring you know, running day-to-day -day operations, like I said, and making sure that there's security, there's perimeter security, there's um, logical security, your access controls, ensuring that there's um, sufficient 
um, you know, backup for, 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 for power, ensuring that the, 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 this, this protection of the underlying yeah. infrastructure yeah. that runs um, the, 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 the actual services. Um, the, 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 like I said, there are different service models from infrastructure as a service, where um, you are hosting virtual machines for your customers. They bring their, 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 their applications, right. and then you host them on your, on your physical, um, physical um, systems. Right. Or uh, in, in terms of infrastructure as a service, you go say maybe up to the, the virtualization layer, and then from there onwards, it becomes the responsibility of your of the customer. But there are many different mod models. Um, uh, I think in presentations that we've had today, we've we've we've, we've had um, two gentlemen presenting on software as a service. With software as a service, um, the responsibility gets pushed a bit more. Um, in that case, um, the cloud services provider is responsible for everything, and the u end user only just plugs onto the application and uses it. So yeah. it becomes um, software as a service. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, there are different um, yeah. deployment models. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Sangi, you are in the uh, strategy advisory role of technology. Yes. Which means that you are able to actually then simplify it further. Yes. So I need you to just break it down. What is a cloud? I think it's easy for us sitting here to, yeah. to assume that everybody knows what a cloud is. What is a cloud? Okay. So basically, every small organization, or every organization for that matter, does have ICT needs. So they uh, have infrastructure, they have software, um, they have databases, they have business applications. And so when you think about a cloud, it, in essence, is outsourcing all your IT needs to a provider is what cloud service provider does. And um, as, as we have heard, um, there are multiple models and multiple engagement levels that an organization can undertake with a cloud service provider. Uh, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about uh, software as a service, and platform as a service. But yeah. in a nutshell, it's basically saying to an organization that you have your ICT needs, you focus on your core business, and let us focus on what we do best which yeah. is what a cloud service provider does. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Stimela, you, in your presentation you were touching on how you, some of your platforms are able to assist uh, your clients through, through leveraging the cloud and providing them the value that your platforms bring. What are the, without talking deep into the applications themselves, what are the advantages of clients actually plugging into a cloud environment? I think it's precisely on the definitions that we have just touched on. Mm. Um, you have taken and relegated what needs to be done by those who do it best yeah. to take care of that. That is the first advantage that comes with uh, having to go the route of cloud. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have to have overheads of time and again going back to management and asking, we need to increase the capacity of my data center. That's one. Two, uh, you don't have to worry about consistently doing maintenance, yeah. uh, be it your security maintenance or let alone having to test your data center in terms of failovers. Mm. People that do it best take care of this as their daily work. Right. On a day-to-day -day basis, they make sure that uh, there's optimal usage of your, your infrastructure as well as uh, availability of your software solution. And most importantly, mm. like I was saying, um, we, we come at a time when COVID has really hit hard on our pockets. And it becomes quite important to start thinking about the costs of having to do CapEx, yep. capital expenditure. Um, so cloud immediately offers us that uh, immediate ability to uh, reduce cost of ownership and cost of implementation of systems. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I suppose that the the this has to be translated to the customer experience. That at the end of the day, it is the customer and the business who ultimately are able to reach those expected customer experience. Okay. So um, you talk about customer experience, and I think uh, what is obviously critical is the, 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 the comfort that the customer gets in actually having that service being provided by somebody else. Um, in so saying, Mr. That's uh, Mr. Mongalo. So, in so saying, what are the service levels that you 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 get into with your customers? 
So there's a couple of things that obviously you'd want to look at in a, in a client sort of setup. Uh, from a service level agreement point of view, I would need to know the availability of my, my platforms. I would need to know the redundancy of my platforms. Um, how quickly can I get back up on my feet if something goes wrong with the, the primary instance of my, my platform? What are the security service levels that... So, so the, if you can just touch on those sort of things. And... Uh, yeah. hey. I think, I think yes, as, as you said, um, you know, because you can, you can actually... Some, some there are different, like I said, I talked about deployment models earlier. But there's also um, a case where a, cu a customer, like you're saying, um, is looking for, for, for backup as a service, as an example. So there will be th th there are certain KPIs that we need to, that we look at. Um, there are things that like like your your your, your um, recovery time objectives, recovery yeah. point objectives. So th those are some of the things that when you get into an agreement with a cloud services provider, you say, okay, should I have um, an outage? How long is it um, going to take for yeah. me to, to to recover? For example, like th 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 and then um, at what point? Um, in the recovery, because there could have been some transactions that have been lost. At what point will I be able to recover? Is it going to be two days or whatever it is? So there are different um, KPIs that, that 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 you need to look at in terms of, of in terms of recovery. And then the other thing, like you're rightly saying, um, all these um, technologies that we implement have different um, they, they have different availability, you know, percentages over a year. For example, we'll say. Um, maybe there's 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 uh, tier 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 one um, it's certain availability tier two maybe 99.741 percent. So when a customer chooses where to put their data, and mm. um, these are some of the considerations that they they need to look at. Over and above that, there's also um, there are also different um, you know security standards and and that 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 you need to look at and see if that particular data center provider. Um, conforms to, to those standards. Right, so right. there's a whole lot of um, um, and other, other 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 things that you need to look at as a customer when you're yeah. looking at uh, like you're talking about 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 redundancy as well. Um, is that is that is that particular um, data center um, that do they have a recovery site? Mm. So that should anything happen to to, to to my data, then I can have recovery. But remember also that, 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 that there are times where there are certain instances where a customer will say, okay, fine. I, I have my own in, 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 in on-premises data center, but I'm looking for disaster recovery. So I'm going to use somebody else for my DR. Mm. So, so, so in that case also, you, you, I mean, there are so many different deployment models in right. a sense. So when, 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 you, when you look at, when you want to, 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 to have your journey to the cloud, you really need to, 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 to look at your, your cloud strategy yep. and look at what, what, what options are available because uh, it is really not a, a one-size-fits-all model. Okay, thanks. Um, so l let's let's take a quick turn just with uh, from a pol policy perspective, uh, perhaps Mr. Kapalezu, and uh, just gain a slight understanding of what policies we have in place to regulate, um, you know, the residency of cloud hosting in this country. Okay. You know, from a policy perspective, what we currently have, which actually affect the host of the data, more especially inside the country, is the Data Protection Act. And that act has been actually passed, I think, in 2018. However, it has not come into force. But it has provisions which actually requires, you know, you to make sure that the data, the personal data of people mm -hmm. is hosted within the country. Or else, if it is outside the country, yeah. you will seek the minister's permission. Because really the whole aim here, even if the act has not come into force, is, is you need to have laws which ensure the protection of data. If you are hosting your data outside the country, do your due diligence in order to ensure that in case of any breach of that data, because bear in mind, as a service provider, for example, you are responsible for that data. If it gets breached outside the country, you are not going to say it's the cloud service provider. You are the one who is liable. So make sure that you, know, you have looked at those legislation, what recourse do you have, and what laws are in place. We have seen so many countries coming up with laws. I think those who are dealing with Europe, they have realized that there is a, a general data protection regulations, which actually requires all the data of the European to be hosted within the European right. community, right. unless you do have the authorization. So those are some of the challenges which you do now need to have in place. And we have been actually having discussion with government to make sure that the Data Protection Act do come into force, because we do realize the importance that 
you know, for our data centers to grow, we need to be having some legislation because nobody will bring the data to Botswana to be hosted in Botswana if we do not have a proper data protection framework because he, the first thing he actually checks is, will my data be protected when it's hosted in Botswana? Yeah. So it's not only about protecting, it's also be able to attract the business from coming outside to come to Botswana. Mm -hmm. We need to put that framework in place. And I think uh, it's very, very important that we work on the regulations and we put that, those, that act into force as soon as possible. Uh, if I may just ask uh, an additional question, do, do you overlay onto that regulation or that policy uh, uh, aspect of security? Okay. Because I think that the, the idea that data is hosted in country need not necessarily mean that it's safe. Yes. So the area where we are, okay, with regard to the act, the act of the Data Protection Act, currently it does not, BOCRA does not have any responsibility on it. It is with, currently with the Office of President and uh, it's one of those things which you, it needs to come into force. But we are actually working on the other angle from the issue of cybersecurity, mm. where we are now basically making sure, because under the uh, Communication and Regulatory Act, we have the responsibility to ensure that our customers are protected. So we are actually now engaging the service providers to say, let's not only provide service which is not secure, let's provide the service which is secure. That's why I was talking about the concept because one of the things which we have observed is, you know, people when they talk about protecting, they protect themselves as a network service provider, but they forget about the protection of the consumers at the end. Mm. And we, I have engaged time and again to say, Consumers, they are part of your network. So when you talk about protection, make sure that also you take them into a... So we are actually engaging and making sure that there is that enforcement to make sure that we are coming up with some guidelines mm. to assist the service providers to implement some secure because we have realized that some providers were really actually putting the consumers at risk and it's something which we are working on. Yeah. The concept which I indicated earlier on is the one which is mainly working on that. And we, is, it is an angle which we are... And in addition, like uh, Ramazi represented, we are working on the National Cyber Security Act and our hope is the cabinet has just gave us a proposal to actually make sure that that law is drafted and it will be actually an enhancement to the existing law so that we make sure that, you know, because with the Cyber Security Act, when it's in place, we can even now put mandatory standard to say, if you are doing A, B, C, D, you have to implement this standard. Mm. Like, for example, if I Something take right. the ISO 27001 yeah. to say, you know, for you to be able to host this kind of service, Certainly. you have yeah. to implement this. Uh, so those are some of the things which you are currently working on. So prior to actually having this, this, this law enacted in place, what leverage do you have to actually met out consequences for people who... Because yeah. I think what I'm gathering is it, it's slightly suggestive at this stage yeah, and not necessarily enforced. You know what? Even prior to this act, when you look at most of the sectors which you are talking about, most of them, they have been regulated. Mm. You will find that the existing legislation, you can actually use them because it may have not been written to say cybersecurity or security. But, for example, it talks about you protecting the consumers. And I think all the legislation for the regulated sectors, they have those provisions. Right. So we are actually going to be working with the, the regulators of those institutions because, like, right now, we have started a process where we wanted to do what we call a national cyber security risk assessment of all the critical information infrastructure yeah. in the country. Yeah. And we actually we went to the regulators and said, give us a, we know you have a provision, and we are engaging them, we are, we are carrying out that survey through those provisions so that, you know, even because cybersecurity will not wait for us to make the laws in place, mm. we need to be keep on working. So we'll use what we have right now existing in order to actually make sure that the consumers are protected. From the communication providers, I can simply assure you that BOCRA, because it's responsible for regulating those sectors, yeah. it will ensure that they implement security measures. Mm. That's why actually we're engaging them through the concept. Okay, no, makes sense. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you a, a very naive question, which is, um, Restimela, who would you say needs cloud services? Who needs cloud services? Or who uses cloud services? Look, when we, when we have to define the business needs of every institution, uh, they're always based on the strategy of that particular, uh, of that particular um, institution. But the question could be, 
who needs to be digitally transformed, who needs to have ICT in place? Everybody. Mm. Uh, the world is flat. We are trading with just about everybody and we need efficiency, we need growth in terms of the businesses that we have. So everybody needs cloud, but it's a question of what are the business strategy at that point and what needs to be put in place. Uh, the conversations are guiding us in the right sphere to say that some, on the basis of the models that are available, uh, one needs to appreciate what is there internally within an organization to be able to make the right decisions. What is it that we need to take to cloud? What is it that we need to retain? And how do we bring about the hybrid model in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, there is continuity? Uh, the, the business needs are unique to every yeah. business. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth of the matter is the trends that are available in as far as the world is concerned is to fast move towards uh, cloud-based technology for simple reasons. Let those who do the things best deal with it. And while you deal with what you are doing it and perfecting it and doing mm -hmm. it right, customer experience. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Mongalo, what are the, I'm, I'm just curious for you to now touch on the available perhaps varying scales for different level organizations or even at an individual level of uh, the services that you provide, whether, whether we're talking uh, monetary wise or, or capacity wise. Um, okay. All right. Um, I think um, at the beginning, when we when we when, when we launched our services, we we're looking. Um, th we pitched them at at enterprise level, mm. meaning um, we we saw them as as enterprise products. But um, I think I think that's when we were doing our our, you know, our our customer journeys um, back when we were starting. But mm. um, you know, due to time lapse and what has we have seen changing, um, we have seen that um, actually. We, we need to we need to, we need to, to look at um, other market segments, not necessarily just the, the enterprise market segment. We also need to look at um, SMEs, because yeah. um, the, the the way we have um, the way we have defined our packages, um, they're not necessarily even though even though I, I, was, I'm, I was saying that we're targeting the enterprise market segment, they are actually um, we, 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 uh, Mr. Mr. Nitin can 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 vouch for me here. We we do have packages. That are affordable to to, 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 to to you know to smaller markets um, you know your 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 your, your SMEs yeah. and even 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 up to up to up to up to individuals. But the, the, the biggest challenge with 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 with, with um, individuals is that it becomes difficult because um, as, as you can imagine, we are also still um, on the journey of of w w maybe we'll never get to. Okay, let me not say, use the word never, but it will, it will take us time to get to the level of your hyperscalers, like your Google and, and your, and your yeah. Microsoft. Yeah. But for the for the for the for the, for the Botswana um, market, we, 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 we should have sufficient capacity to, or we have sufficient sufficient capacity to to, to, to be able to host any um, um, any anybody from from the different market segments. Right. We do have um, different packages for both um, infrastructure as a service, for backup as a service, and storage as a service to meet the needs of any um, of, 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 of those market segments. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think at this stage we have a couple of questions from the viewers. Um, we're going to start just start with the first one. Ray Kenneth, software as a service. Do you think remote SMME Botswana is ready? First email. It is my hope that uh, earlier on when I made the presentation, uh, they understood the context that we are, we are operating in, in Botswana. Like I was saying, when you, when you move around the entire country, uh, we have a very good electricity uh, supply. And it's a very important part in terms of ensuring that you are able to have ICT. Secondly, uh, Bofinet uh, just recently told us that they have rolled out fiber uh, to about uh, 10,000 kilometers of fiber throughout the entire country. And earlier on, there was a farmer, Ravaka, who was telling us that he is using VSET um, in his farm, and he even takes his kids there where they're able to even use e-learning. So yes, uh, the small businesses are ready, uh, we, I, I showed a practical examples of those that are even in the Delta, 
and those that are even on the outskirts of Habroni, and they do not necessarily have fiber connected to them. They're using 3G and 4G. Um, SMMEs are ready. I believe that the country is ready, and there is a growing cultural shift um, from the older generation to the younger people. And this cultural shift means that we need to take care of uh, the customers that are becoming younger and younger as, as time goes on. I really believe that uh, Botswana is ready for, yeah. for, for the transformation. Totally. I think, I think the, the, the combination of connectivity, as you say, uh, the infrastructure with electricity, uh, the improved connectivity that we've been talking about most of today, and... Um, I think it's also very important not to separate content consumption that is business related to social consumption. Because we, we, we use cloud services almost on a daily basis through social media, through all the other applications that we interact with that we don't necessarily see as enterprise related. Um, I do think there's another question that should be coming in through. Then this one is to Mr. Mangalo. What types of services are available via the cloud computing model at Centara Data Center. I think you touched a little bit on yes. this, but maybe just Yeah, I, 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 I think I did touch on this, but um, I'll, I'll go back to the, to, to, to the person who's asking there to, to say um, we, we, we have um, infrastructure as a service where we, 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 we have virtual machines um, where you, somebody can <coughs> then bring their, their applications and we can host them on on our on, on our data center, um, these are these are the same these are the same um, you know services that are available on your on your on your AWS on Azure. Um, I don't know whether maybe it's because people are not aware of our, our, our products, but we do have these products in country, and we should really localize um, um, data. Like right now, we've been we've been speaking to to, to the gentleman, on the, Mr. Nathan and 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 Resti Melagaku. Um, you find in most cases we have SMEs in the country that are hosting their data on, for example, AWS. We should really be localizing this in internet traffic. What's the point of me being Tepo here, um, consuming a service that Mr. Stimela is hosting on AWS, which means traffic has to go outside the country, and then it comes back again for me to get the service. Mm -hmm. When we can actually just use, um, I mean, localized traffic and just have exchanges right inside the data center without any data leaving or traffic leaving the, 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 the country, that will also cut um, on, on, on our, on our internet, uh, internet traffic, international internet traffic. So yes, um, we have infrastructure as a service. We have backup as a service where you can um, replicate or backup your, your workloads at, 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 at Centlaha. We, we can offer you um, disaster recovery as a service. Um, we can also offer you software, in a, uh, software as a service through our partnerships with, bo uh, with, with the likes of um, Borre, Borre Nitin, yeah. So those are the services okay. that we currently have at, at, at Central Radio Center. And we are looking to, to, to expand. We are, not just, uh, we, we are not just resting on our laurels now. We know that um, cloud services is evolving currently, and we are talking about infrastructure as code, where, 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 where you, you, you we're introducing the likes of your Kubernetes, your Dockers. So we are looking at that as well and, 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 and looking to continue innovating. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I hope that covers that question quite extensively. Uh, th there should be another question coming through, and this one is to Reke Paletu. What is the Electronic Records and Evidence Act 2014, and how does it protect us in Botswana on the cyberspace? Okay. The Electronic uh, Records Evidence Act, really the whole aim of this act was to try to facilitate the submission of evidence, electronic evidence in court. What is actually advocate is you can actually bring your system. You know, we have had challenges where people uh, come to us with uh, an email, say, I want to certify this evidence before I go to court. I said, how will I vouch that, you know, really, she is yours. Yeah. But what we actually certify is the systems to make sure that it have the necessary controls, because if we actually make sure that the system you have it has the necessary controls and it can vouch for that. Mm. What we are basically saying, the evidence which will come out of it, it will actually be, you know, we can vouch for the integrity of it. So really the whole aim of it is to make sure that, you know, the evidence which is gathered from those uh, certified systems is actually can be easily submitted in court. It does not stop people from submitting the evidence in court. They can, but, you know, we cannot vouch, you know, we, when you bring the evidence. If mm. you want your system to be certified, submit your systems first 
before you can actually bring the, the records to ourselves. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I'm just going to give each one of our panelists uh, a minute to just make a case for cloud. Starting from the far end with uh, <laughs> Rusty Miller, sorry for putting you on the spot. Take us. Thank you, thank you Rokwane. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, digital transformation is has been on the cards and the agenda of the country for a while. The, the President, His Excellency, is time and again telling us the importance of us having to become a knowledge economy. And uh, cloud-based technology offers us, particularly startup companies such as my, ours, uh, an opportunity to rapidly scale up mm -hmm. uh, as one, two, to be able to take our innovation and take it uh, not only within the context of Botswana. Uh, we, are, we are quite excited with what we are doing beyond mm -hmm. the borders of Botswana. And we don't have to be physically there. We mm -hmm. just have to be taking advantage of the cloud-based uh, uh, platforms that are available. I think it's about time for uh, what I'm passionate about, small and micro uh, enterprises to find themselves and grow towards digital transformation. The time is now. Mm. Uh, there's never a better time than now. Thank you. Mr. Sangi. Well, you know, sm small to medium businesses, or any businesses for that matter, are experiencing tremendous amount of flux in their environment. Um, complex suppliers, uh, changing customer requirements, uh, technology, competition, and so on and so forth. Uh, the day and age right now is to adapt and adapt quickly. And by being able to outsource a non-value-added activity as ICT uh, to a service provider that is an expert in delivering those services. A business is able to focus on their key drivers of, of growth, which is innovation and, and marketing. Thank you. From my angle, I would really be encouraging as we move and more services to be online. It is very important that we also grow our sector and I'm more keen that we have more cloud services in Botswana. You know, as much as we can utilize international cloud, what I'm actually more keen is, you know, we need to build our own data centers and we can actually benefit <laughs> even by hosting the data which are coming from other countries, hosting them in Botswana and providing the service to the outside world. And it is very important that we really do emphasize I think we do have to realize that not every business can be able to have the necessary skills to, rev, to run its own in-house IT. So let's utilize the cloud services. Our service providers that are providing those data centers, and they are secure, and we'll keep on working to make sure that they are secure, and your data is secure when you're hosted in their place. So really, that's what my emphasis is. You know, data is key moving forward. Mm. Most of the countries right now that are talking about the issues of data sovereignty, data localization, those are the debates which are happening at an international world, you know, and they're going to affect us. You know, we need to make sure that we also make sure that we protect our own data and we can utilize for the benefit of our economy. Great. Yes, sir. Um, from my, my, my point of view, especially as a because I'm, I'm also a, a cloud consumer as well as a, a, a cloud, um, you know, services provider. But but for me, what what I can say um, is that we as as BTC, we may not be able to compete with with the hyperscalers in terms of scale, but in terms of technology, we have we have the, the requisite the right technology to be able to host um, our, our, our our any workloads um, within within the country. So my my, my, my mine would be just to say. Um, you know, whoever has, 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 has cloud has decided to, 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 have it, to take his journey to the cloud. We are available as BTC. We have the right technology. We have the right skills. And um, we, can, we can really, um, you know, host, 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 host our, our, our customers in country to, 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 to address issues um, raised as, as mm -hmm. they've been raised by Rekapilet here yeah. on, on data sovereignty. And so, so basically, um, we are available as BTC. And um, my, 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 I'm just, like I'm saying, we, we have the right technologies, mm. we are secure. The other thing is, um, you know, when you host w w within the country, because we already have existing networks. For, for example, our MPLS is, is all over the country, so you don't even have to take your traffic to the internet. So in terms of, um, you know, user experience and in terms of, 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 
of, of those latencies and things like that because everything is in country will just be connected it's like it's just, it's just like extending your your, your 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 local area network wherever yeah. you are sitting so in terms of uh, b b because the other thing i mean the other thing that i need to to, to make um a point of is that uh, btc we t btc is also um using its own data center so basically we treat from the data center perspective we treat btc as a as a tenant within right. the data center so it's 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 not something that is um, it, it's up there in the air it's something that um has been proven to work yeah. we yeah. also um are already hosting um, some customers within Botswana, and we, th they've been very happy with the with the service so far. Awesome. So we are available. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, your insightful contributions to this conversation. To the viewers, thank you for having joined this conversation. And to those who sent in questions, thank you some more. We'll see you again later. Thank you. I certainly hope that you enjoyed our final uh, panel discussion for Digital Shift BW powered by BTC. And thank you so much for Ohona taking us through all of these panel discussions and asking the right questions. And thanks to you as well for reaching out to us virtually. As you saw, we kept our promise and we shared all of your comments and questions. We continue again tomorrow. So we do encourage you to visit all of BTC's platforms, including the website as well as social media to understand further how you can be part of the conversation of Digital Shift BW. Well, on behalf of myself, Ohona, as well as um, all the teams behind the scenes, it's been fantastic. Let's do it again tomorrow. Hosiyam. <laughs>